Dear participants of the forum, your honor, dear judges, dear experts, good morning. I'm happy and honored uh, to welcome you here at the S International Forum in Case Law of the European Court of Human Rights. It's nice that the forum is a well recognized event among legal professionals, and the number of applications uh, to participate in the forum is uh, evidence to that. And thanks to the Council of Europe, the forum is broadcast uh, live. Henry Wurtz and the OC project coordinator in Ukraine unfortunately couldn't make it and uh, she requested me to uh, read uh, his uh, welcome uh, remarks. Пані та панове, ваші високоповажності, я рада вітати вас сьогодні на восьмому міжнародному форумі з практики Європейського суду з прав людини. Я рада бачити таку різноманітну групу правників, серед яких є судді, адвокати, юристи. Thank you very much indeed. And now I am happy to give the floor to Ilya Chernohorenko, project, uh, Senior Project Officer, uh, the Council of Europe, Directorate uh, General for Human Rights and Rule of Law. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me, uh, on behalf of the uh, Director General for Human Rights and Rule of Law of the Council of Europe, uh, welcome uh, all participants of uh, this forum. And that's an annual forum on uh, European Court uh, case law. Uh, it's the eighth uh, time uh, when uh, Lviv University has this reputable people in this premises, uh, judges of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Supreme Court judges, uh, the uh, judges of the courts of appeal and local uh, courts, representatives of academia, human rights activists, representatives of the National School of Judges of Ukraine, best uh, lawyers uh, of national and international law firms. Each of us uh, has its uh, own role and uh, capacity, but we are all united by pursuing in the values of the European Convention of Human Rights, the values that serve the basis for a modern uh, European uh, legal order. In this very premises, in early 20th century, uh, Herr Schlauterbach uh, used to study, one of the founders of the uh, modern international system of human rights protection. 
as Mr. Rabinovich uh, said, uh, Herschel de Bachtier is the uh, inspirator and the first uh, scholar that uh, uh, drafted the principles of Universal Declaration of Human Rights and European Convention of Human Rights, uh, apparently. The agenda of the day one of the forum is independent court. It's uh, extremely important subject matter for Ukraine. In its first and the only um, address, a newly appointed Secretary General of the Council of Europe uh, expressed uh, her concern as to abidance uh, and compliance with the uh, principle of independent court uh, and judges in Ukraine. Similar concerns were expressed by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And it is today when we are looking forward to, to the first uh, draft of the opinion of the Venice Commission as to the compliance uh, of uh, Ukrainian legislation, um, the draft uh, law that was uh, signed into the law, and compliance with the principle of independence of uh, judges. So we are looking forward to an interesting and intense discussion today. So I wish uh, all of you uh, energy and uh, fruitful information exchange, as well as um, enjoy the city of Lviv. Thank you. Let me give the floor to the host of today's event, Vladimir uh, Melnik, Rector of Anfranco National University of Lviv. Thank you. Um, uh, let me welcome the participants of the AC International Forum on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I'm happy and honored to, to welcome you here. That's a landmark event for us, despite uh, the fact that uh, on an annual basis, uh, the university uh, hosts uh, various events here. It's around 200 of them annually, but the status, the importance of this uh, forum in particular allows me to say that this forum is of extreme importance of, uh, in terms of its legal value and the subjects that we are going to discuss today. I am uh, not a representative of legal professions, but uh, I uh, have a lot of colleagues and friends uh, among you. Uh, so you have a diverse uh, group here uh, of uh, people that pursue the same values. Well, um, people of the same mind is not the right way of putting it, because same mind doesn't uh, sound good. Uh, diversity is important, as Mr. Rabinovich says. Um, I appreciate your coming here. Special thanks uh, to um, Ms. Denishevska. She is the person that uh, remains in the limelight uh, today, uh, the, as well as the Supreme Court is in the center of everybody's attention. And we extend her uh, moral support, at least. Uh, and this event is another attempt to make sure that uh, European standards and values are implemented in the case law of Ukrainian courts. Lviv uh, University is not just the premises, that's the uh, environment, uh, that's the dynamics, the trends that we see developing here. The university serves the center of uh, education, academia, thanks to um, faculty and students here. And uh, this year, despite all these unfavorable conditions, university keeps developing in this re God. We have 21,000 uh, students at our university, and jointly with the Kiev University, we are leaders among the uh, top ranking universities. We receive 50,000 applications every year, so that's uh, a sign that the number of uh, people um, that are eager to study at our universities is increasing. So, And this event, you know that it is broadcast live, and this event uh, is uh, going to contribute to um, enhancing the uh, prestige and reputation of the university. The myth that uh, 
keep uh, amassing, claiming that uh, um, young people are not keen on joining economy, uh, it's not really popular at this stage. Well, it's not true. Um, I know that uh, at our university, we really have uh, a high competition to join academia. We have 700 uh, postgraduate students and scholars at the university. Uh, we are among the top three universities uh, in Ukraine as a scientific uh, school. And this year, we conducted the study to uh, see how well we are doing in terms of scientific development out of 16 uh, uh, categories. Uh, Lviv University was uh, the best as the best humanitarian uh, school and medical school. That's the results of the national report uh, proving that uh, science in Ukraine is an important element of social, political, social, uh, economic changes. And the university serves the platform and the source for new ideas. We are trying to implement them, to incorporate them into our social life. And that allows me with cautious optimism uh, to say that everything is going to be good in Ukraine, since we have um, high ambitious uh, projects and goals. And all of that should be implemented for the common good of Ukrainian society and Ukrainian people. Welcome again at uh, our university. We keep uh, our doors open for all of you. And uh, we are always uh, ready, as uh, uh, my colleague says, uh, to welcome uh, um, fora like this uh, with uh, reputable people like you. Are. We are ready to discuss how to improve political, legal, and any other important elements uh, uh, for Ukraine to make sure that rule of law is abided by and is pursued in our uh, country. Uh, let me thank the organizers uh, of this forum. Thank you very much indeed, and wish you fruitful work. Thank you. Let me give uh, the floor to the President of the Supreme Court, uh, um, Judge Danishevsko. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, honored and happy to welcome all of you on behalf of the Supreme Court of Ukraine. It is very important for us to be here at this forum to be uh, next to you, next to the representatives of legal professions and uh, the judges of the European Court. Uh, I would like to traditionally start by thanking the organizers, the OEC, the Council of Europe uh, pr project, Council of Europe pro project, uh, uh, support to the implementation of the judicial reform in Ukraine. Let me thank the National University of Ivan Franco, the National School of Judges for this excellent opportunity uh, to discuss the uh, European Court case law. Uh, this is my second time here in a similar forum uh, in, uh, well, it's my second time in Lviv University, and it's the first time when I participate in the forum. But uh, from my colleagues, uh, uh, I know that thanks to the organizers and thanks to active debates uh, and discussions at the forum, this forum has uh, been turned into a powerful platform to discuss the uh, European Court uh, case law. We believe that uh, at the moment uh, we are at the new stage uh, of reflections uh, of the European Convention and its application. Uh, In-depth uh, study of the European Court uh, judgments allows for us to move along the way of uh, decreasing or eliminating formalistic approaches uh, to uh, interpretation of uh, the law. We better and deeper understand the uh, uh, content, the principles of the convention, and that's our real life uh, of uh, judges, and that's becoming a real life of the Ukrainians, that uh, thanks to the convention, find justice not only at the European Court of Human Rights, but in the national 
international courts as well. When studying the European Court uh, judgments and case law, we strengthen the um, the, the national judgments as well. So by uh, providing better substantiation, and that increases confidence and trust to judiciary and courts. While uh, absorbing this European court uh, uh, case law and uh, European experience, we face some challenges as well, since the European um, court case law is sometimes used uh, inappropriately, not to the point, and uh, it doesn't uh, uh, add uh, any value to our decisions. And that uh, uh, causes some concerns and indignation of the European court uh, uh, judges as well. I think because uh, European court uh, judgments look uh, transparent and uh, proper, but sometimes uh, they are not properly used by the national judges as the reference. We are working on that to improve that, and the National School of Judges contributes a lot to uh, make sure that European court case law is studied and properly applied. The Supreme uh, Court undertook uh, an obligation to keep informing about the European court judgments with respect to Ukraine or some important judgments that were um, made uh, with respect to um, other countries and we disseminate this information internally and to the courts of lower instances. We. Uh, uh, do this to make sure that uh, these judgments are uh, executed. The Supreme Court uh, is uh, in charge of enforcement of the European Court judgments uh, with respect to individual measures. We cooperate with the Ministry of Justice and other uh, branches of power in search for solutions uh, as to general measures provided for by the European uh, Court uh, judgments. It's not always uh, an easy way sometimes, but uh, oh, we do our best uh, uh, to uh, find the uh, best solutions to reduce the um, uh, period of time to execute uh, judgments. We are searching for the ways to uh, improve uh, the level of executions of the national courts uh, to um, comply and uh, fulfill Burmich at all against Ukraine judgment. And we do have some successes there. At least there is an understanding how this process uh, um, can uh, be made faster. Sometimes we lack communication and uh, uh, well coordinated efforts to make sure it happens. Though I am uh, happy to say that uh, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe said that uh, in the course of recent uh, uh, time, uh, thanks to the efforts of the Ministry of Justice and uh, the Supreme Court uh, did that, we uh, managed to, to uh, enforce uh, um, some important judgments. The statistics of the European uh, Court uh, says that uh, in the course of uh, six months uh, of uh, 2019, there were more than 60 cases against Ukraine were heard, and most of them were um, satisfied. Looking at the uh, grounds for satisfaction, we see that there is uh, uh, the trend there. So there is uh, uh, the repetition in terms of the issues. There are the same issues that are uh, raised in the applications. So the set of issues uh, was um, added uh, by the scenes mentioned in the case that normally that's a uh, um, uh, jurisdiction when the party to the case uh, is not notified about the uh, um, hearing as to uh, appeal and doesn't uh, even receive the copy of uh, the uh, ruling. And naturally, uh, in these instances, the uh, court uh, uh, refers the case back to the um, appeal instance uh, to 
prohibitory uh, reheard to make sure that uh, the rights of people are enforced. There are a lot of other things that we need to keep working on. And another big challenge for us is the judgment uh, in Paolo versus the Ukraine um, case. This judgment, uh, I believe, did not come into effect yet, but thanks to the uh, notification, uh, well, or rather the press release of the European Court, we are aware of the judgment. And naturally, uh, this judgment is not easy to execute since it uh, deals with the law, application of the law on uh, cleansing of power, and uh, it affects the rights and uh, destinies of many people. For us uh, to cope better with the execution of the European Court judgments and the national court judgments, we are assisted by our partners. We keep cooperating with various uh, Council of Europe institutions, with the European Court uh, of Human Rights, uh, and uh, thanks to this cooperation, we search for a joint, uh, so, uh, a joint uh, measures uh, to execute judgments, and not only that, but to, to to resort to the measures that would prevent uh, um, any violation of human rights and uh, diminish the number of applications uh, um, submitted by Ukrainians to the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you very much indeed for uh, all the support that we received from the European Court of Human Rights, and today's event is another evidence of that. We have uh, four judges of the European Court that are going to speak today. Um, Hanna um, Jajutkiewska, special thanks go to you. You always assist in organizing events, but uh, thank you for being here today and for picking up this particular subject matter for your presentation. That's extremely important. Uh, issue for us since judicial independence is under threat at the moment and we are very well aware that when the judges are intimidated when the uh, judicial guarantees are violated it's hard to uh, expect uh, decision that would contribute to judicial independence. But we very much hope that uh, the voice of reason will prevail and uh, Council of Europe standards will prevail and the values that uh, are abided by in many countries and uh, the values that we pursue will prevail. Thank you very much indeed for inviting for this event uh, and uh, hopefully the presentations are going to be interesting, discussions are going to be uh, active and interesting and that's all be enriched. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me give the floor to Rector of the National School of Judges uh, of Ukraine, uh, Mr. Mikoloni Shuk. Thank you, Natalia. Good morning, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, uh, welcome to the participants. I'm happy to see the colleagues from the European Court. Uh, it's a very good opportunity to exchange uh, uh, opinions among the professionals, and uh, it's good that Lviv uh, University maintains this tradition when uh, at the end of autumn or early in, uh, in winter, we have a chance to come to Lviv uh, for the forum like this. This forum has special significant since uh, it is held against uh, the drop of lawmaking uh, and uh, scientific uh, uh, active work uh, that uh, is focused on uh, searching for the ways of improving judiciary so that uh, we'll, uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, achieve this high standard that Ukrainian society is aspiring for. As uh, you know, uh, dear colleagues, we have the Presidential Commission uh, uh, that has been set up uh, on uh, improving uh, the reform of judiciary, and there is a working group on improving judiciary that is focused on the issues that are on the agenda. So th whether these are the presentations or the sessions that we have um, on the agenda of the forum that actually matches uh, um, the issues that we are discussing in the working group, we discuss the reform of the uh, 
cassation uh, instance, uh, improving the access to justice. We are working on the issue of eliminating excessive uh, regulation administ in administering justice in Ukraine. Another important issue is uh, procedural um, e economy. We don't want the the um, the, the, the uh, case uh, hearing and management to be so cumbersome. Um, we are undertaking some radical steps with uh, respect to pretrial stage. Unfortunately, paragraph 4 of Article 124 of the Constitution that provides uh, for uh, the um, right uh, for a mandatory pretrial settlement is latent. Uh, it uh, has not been applied. And that uh, is in sync with the stance of the European Court that uh, introduces additional mechanisms for uh, settling the dispute between the parties to a dispute that uh, go to the European Court of Human Rights. So both uh, mediation and uh, uh, and other alternative uh, um, dispute resolution means uh, should be actively engaged so that it would d uh, decrease the burden on the courts and disputes uh, uh, could be settled as early as it is um, appropriate. So that's uh, what our efforts are aimed at. And it's not only lawmakers, but uh, representatives of legal professionals, academia, that draft their proposals and submit uh, to us. Another important issue is uh, the uh, execution of judgments. It is unsatisfactory according to the state of enforcement. And strange as it might seem, but despite the uh, lengthy period of uh, development of our country and with all the uh, changes that we saw in our country, we still have 32 moratoria um, that exist in the country with respect to the execution of the judgments. It's uh, um, absolutely unconstitutional, but this issue of moratoria keeps being uh, um, postponed for later. And we very much hope that the substantive law and procedural legislation that governs this issue will be improved to deal with that. Here we mean the codification of all the framework that uh, cover execution of judgments, including in the law on uh, the execution of the European Court judgments. Uh, speaking about the uh, SHR, um, I keep saying that it's one of the major civilized accomplishments of the European people. Uh, the convention itself and the court, uh, they both uh, are the best that uh, uh, has been created by the European community uh, with respect to enforcement and protection of uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. And uh, the representation of European courts of uh, um, human rights will allow us uh, to intensify our efforts in search of the effective solutions so that people of Ukraine uh, are proud of the national system of judiciary. Um, and uh, it uh, uh, is in compliance with the standards and values as expected by the community in Ukraine. Um, I have no doubt that that's going to be one of the best uh, um, autumn forum that we have in the country. Thank you, Mikola. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating in this platform. This is the end of the official opening of the forum, and now we are going to start the first session. Uh, we shall start uh, with uh, the challenges to the independent court. One of the guarantees and one of the important components of the rule of law is judicial independence. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights really highlights the important aspects and guarantees of judicial independence. There is a search between a good uh, for a good balance between independence and accountability. And also we trace a number of uh, judicial reforms that are underway in the European countries. Therefore, I would like to give the floor to the 
judge of the European Court of Human Rights uh, from Ukraine, Mrs. Hanna Yudkivska, with a report between Still and Charybdis, Judicial Independence and Accountability. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. There is a tradition in our court uh, that once a year, uh, somewhere in uh, November, when the delegation uh, of the uh, judges of the European Court of Human Rights uh, comes to Lviv in order to meet the judges and the advocates and the lawyers in order to discuss the challenges uh, to the human rights and to discuss the case law of the European Court. So thank you very much for establishing this platform. Thank you, dear Valentina, for bringing the judges of the European Court here. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting the National School of Judges. And I also would like to express gratitude to the Council of Europe. And definitely my gratitude goes to my colleagues who really find a uh, time and efforts to come here. I'm really pleased to see here the familiar faces. I understand what kind of competition is organized at the local level in order to participate in the conference. It means the colleagues constantly try to improve. Uh, and I see also some unfamiliar faces, and that means that more and more people are interested in case law of the European Court and Human Rights. Uh, the topic of my report probably is the most painful is the most important topics um, because now the judicial system undergoes reform. But somehow the authors of the reforms do not set their task uh, to improve the uh, certain conditions under which the independence of uh, judges should be addressed. Uh, definitely, uh, we never uh, doubt the democ democratic principles. The international courts try to address the uh, complaints of judges, try to establish some standards. We have some fresh uh, judgments. Uh, we are, um, have some judgments of the Luxembourg court uh, that stated that uh, Poland uh, violated the European legislation by reducing the pension age for judges, and it was different page, uh, pension age for uh, women and uh, men. Uh, there are some violations of the uh, charter of the uh, key rights, and according to this charter, the judges and the court institutions should meet the requirements of effective remedies and to guarantee access to independent uh, courts. So it means they are protected from uh, some pressure. The reform that was complained about uh, was aimed at reducing the pension age and was actually about those judges who were working in the Supreme Court and their mandates were uh, just terminated. And therefore, there were fears that the principle of a continuity of judges will be violated. The court referred to the opinion of the Venice, Venice Commission and uh, there were doubts that uh, the uh, reform uh, will really aim at this goal set by the government and not, for example, to deprive certain judges of their rights. And also it was about giving the discretionary powers to the executive authorities to leave some judges uh, in their positions irrespective of their age. So it was their arbitrariness, which was obvious. And the court stated that according uh, to the um, European practice, uh, there should be certain guarantees to protect the people who uh, deal in the judicial system. And the principle of continuity of positions means that the judges will stay in their position on condition that they are not of pension age uh, or till the uh, time of their powers. Uh, and this principle is not an absolute principle. Uh, therefore, there can be some exceptions, and these exceptions 
should be well grounded and should meet the principle of proportionality. We remember one of the cases of the ground chamber, Baca uh, versus Hungary. The case was discussed for many times in our platform. It was obvious for the court that uh, just a free uh, term uh, termination of mandate of the head of Supreme Court was pressure of him uh, and was an attempt to stop the freedom of speech. The European Court on Human Rights uh, actually uh, was trying to review the complaints from the applications from the judges regarding the uh, viol dismissal. There were such cases as Volkov, Denisov, as well as the complaints from other side in cases. For example, uh, the complaints that the case was uh, actually considered uh, heard by a dependent court because people uh, thought that the uh, court was under pressure. And the court studied uh, the guarantees from uh, undue pressure, whether really the court was independent and impartial, uh, when, for example, certain executive authorities interfered into the process. And we know famous cases like Revere Style, Agro Holding, where the highest officials were trying to interfere into the court case, were commenting the case, and the European Court of Human Rights really found violations. And though there were no evidence of direct pressure on the judges, still the court didn't look uh, independent and impartial. At the same time, in the case to arm against France, the court was considering uh, the criminal case uh, against the applicant. Um, uh, to whom uh, Mr. Sarkozy joined as the civil uh, theatre. And the such cases uh, who actually, when people could influence the judges, uh, may uh, really have some, put some doubts regarding independence and uh, impartiality. The court started the powers in France, and the fact that the judicial mandate was guaranteed by the Constitution and the judges were protected from certain attempts to violate their independence and some circumstances of this case, because it was not related to the political functions of the president, he didn't provide any evidence or something. So the European Court on Human Rights didn't see any grounds to come to conclusion that, for example, the courts were not independent according to Article 6. So uh, if there are no clear evidence, the court system is considered to be independent. This is the situation in France. All the cases uh, of ICATR uh, regarding dismissal of judges on different grounds, be it disciplinary proceedings or some other proceedings, were related to procedural guarantees uh, of dismissal. In Volkov case, there were also Article 8 regarding violation of oath. Uh, in Vaca's case, there was uh, issues related to uh, violation of freedom of speech, and it was sort of a revenge to the judge for his expressions. But there was not a single case of when, for example, the judge was um, dismissed uh, because of the decision uh, the judge considered. And the first case that will be heard by the European Court on Human Rights for this uh, will be the case versus Ukraine. This is the application from the constitutional judges, which were dismissed by the parliament in 2014 for the judgment uh, that dates back to 2010 that actually allowed Yanukovych to usurp power. I'm not going to comment the case. I'm not going to uh, think what kind of approach the court might take. But definitely, uh, we might, may see that the correlation between judicial independence and accountability becomes important. It is understandable that the notion of judicial mistake is included into the logic of judicial process when potential or mistaken interpretation of certain norms or the mistakes can be um, corrected by the higher instance court but definitely the judges uh, should not be uh, punished for their mistaken uh, 
judgments, and this is an attempt of every new power. And for example, last month, the draft law uh, was registered in the parliament uh, regarding improving the disciplinary proceedings against the judges. And according to it, the presumption of legality of the uh, court ju judicial judgment may be contested, may be complained, and uh, also may be uh, compromised by the decision of the uh, court and human rights. And uh, for example, it relates to those judgments which were cancelled by higher instance courts or the European Courts on Human Rights, because such court judgments are dangerous for society, for the state, etc. This is good, but this is the situation when your good intentions may bring you to the hell. Therefore, there are certain recommendations of the Council of Europe regarding independence and accountability of judges from 2010 state that the judges should not bear personal responsibility when their decision was cancelled or changed uh, uh, by some other courts. And uh, such cases should not uh, bear civil or criminal liability uh, with exception uh, of cases when we see intention. So we, I again want to stress the point of uh, intentional misinterpretation, uh, which might be the case of punishment for the courts. In America, we see uh, the doctrine something more than legal mistake. So it means that legal mistake cannot be considered as a disciplinary case. But if there are some additional factors, this may be the ground for imposing our responsibility on the judge, uh, judges. And this doctrine is also uh, extended by the American judges. And uh, it states that, for example, uh, when the actions of the judge include clear misinterpretation of the law, uh, intentional misinterpretation of the law, and some other factors. And the first case on judicial immunity uh, is the uh, case of the previous century from Connecticut State. Uh, it was the case against uh, versus Seal when uh, the first uh, rule on judicial uh, immunity was taken. Uh, it was stated that there should be no punishment for the judge uh, in case uh, there was not clear in intentions to make mistakes. Uh, here we should talk uh, about decisions, uh, for example, which are uh, when the judges uh, might be afraid that the certain decision uh, will not be accepted by a society. Uh, let's remember some uh, protests under the buildings of the court when society is trying to get the desirable judgment. And this is the case, for example, with some judges when they take the decision uh, which is desired by the society because they are afraid that later they may suffer or some punishment. For example, uh, the judge is punished in America when the judge has taken a judgment uh, which contradicts the law. Uh, if the legal mistake is uh, one, just an episode of a number of mistakes, though we do not have clear uh, figure well, how many cases should be like that. Uh, if the mistake was uh, made with abuse of power, with disrespect to the key rights, with intentional violation of the law, uh, or any other uh, grounds. And also one more case, when a legal mistake is really very serious and very grave. This is a subjective term that requires some further uh, interpretation. And this is the case when we are going to have some objective challenges, I mean, for those who will evaluate the greatness of the judicial mistake. For example, if the mistake looks like very important, very serious, and really very grave, taking into account that this is the collective decision. So what recent cases we have had in this respect? 
I, I think that you were following the latest uh, uh, event in Bolivia, the coup d'etat, the uh, runaway of the president, and actually there were grounds uh, from coming from the Constitutional Court. The president Morales didn't like certain restrictions uh, in the Constitution uh, that he could not uh, be elected for more than two terms. Therefore, he suggested some amendments to the Constitution, but at the general referendum in 2016, the people of Bolivia did not support a vote, vote for such um, amendments. You know that these constitutional restrictions exist and they um, are not uh, liked by people. We know that one of our neighboring countries found uh, the way out of the situation. So, but well, Morales party, um, Morales party addressed uh, the constitutional court of Ukraine and the constitutional court canceled the results of the referendum referring to the uh, human rights, particularly American Convention on Human Rights. The Constitutional Court stated that the human rights of Bolivian politicians and the voters are violated by the restrictions established in the Constitution. All people who were restricted by the law in the Constitution may uh, nominate for a certain position because the right to elect people belongs to the Bolivian people. So this is the judgment of the court with reference to the American Convention. The head of the Organization of American States responsible for execution of convention stated that such interpretation of the convention by the Bolivian court is wrong. The convention does not presuppose the right for eternal power and the decision was purely political in order to keep Moravis in power. The Venice Commission uh, stated this decision as the judicial coup d'etat. So let's ask a question. Can we uh, rule out, for example, that the judge of the Constitutional Court really, truly believed that the active voting right is violated by such restrictions that people, for example, cannot um, vote for the person they want to elect. Can we exclude or rule out such a situation? I'm not sure. Uh, there is another case, for example, the crisis in our, our neighbor, Moldova, when after some doubtful par parliamentary uh, elections, the president addressed the Constitutional Court uh, with a request to interpret the article of the Constitution about the possibility of the president to dismiss the parliament if the coalition is not established uh, three months after. And his question was when uh, the counting of the term, three months term, starts when the elections were recognized as the ones that take place or from the first session of the parliament. The Constitutional Court, first of all, did not respond to this request, but during the last day when the coalition was established, when the new government was appointed, the Constitutional Court takes a judgment uh, not uh, responding to the request of the president and just stating the interpretation of this norm of the law contradicting to the mathematical laws. It even changed the meaning of the words because the clarity should be there. The constitutional court uh, uh, interpreted it as the, the obligation of the president. Additionally, the constitutional court said that three months period is not three months period, but it is 90 days. So the term for uh, shaping the new government has expired prior to the new coalition was established uh, to appoint the new government. Therefore, the constitutional court uh, in Moldova uh, brought in uh, dual um, two, two powers being uh, the, the same type. So the Events Commission criticized the decision as ungrounded. And nevertheless, the uh, judges of the Constitutional Court explained why three months is 90 days uh, with the reference to respective uh, um, uh, articles uh, of the Civil Court. There is a happy end to the story. At the next meeting that lasted uh, three minutes, the court uh, revoked its decision due to the fact that the Constitutional Court was subjected to pressure and was not free in 
and its decision when guided in by the uh, code of um, uh, constitutional jurisdiction. The Constitution Court uh, decided uh, to revoke its decision that was uh, made uh, in uh, um, on, on, on June 19. That was the words of the president. After that, the president and all the judges of the Constitutional Court um, decided uh, to leave their positions. So. That was the story. Naturally, the functional guarantees necessary to guarantee independence of the judges from unlawful external influence and uh, independence does not provide uh, for absolute immunity. The judges should be uh, liable for any potential uh, uh, wrongdoing provided, provided that the uh, procedures of appeal and all elements of the rule of law are available to them and apart of this procedure. More and more often we uh, see the question of the balance between judicial independence and uh, uh, liability being raised. Uh, many governments in the world referring to lack of uh, uh, responsibility and liability of judges are trying to undermine or break the existing mechanisms or division of uh, powers. The Venice Commission is overburdened with requests uh, as to the issues related to the reform of judiciary and we are, are looking forward to the uh, opinion of the Venice Commission in Ukraine as well. They received requests from other countries as well. The uh, recent opinion of last month, uh, uh, that was uh, the changes in Armenia. The changes provide that the judge can face disciplinary liability in Armenia for uh, violations of uh, substantive or procedural law or violations of the uh, rules of conduct of the judge. The judge can be liable only when it is intentional uh, or a result of negligence. Uh, the Venice Commission uh, says that negligence is not uh, the best way to say it because the, the difference between a mistake and negligence is the matter of uh, extent or degree, and the law should deal with the apparent mistakes, and any professional uh, lawyer uh, should uh, know that, uh, especially the ones that might face this uh, liability. Venice Commission said that uh, appeal uh, uh, revocation of the judgment does not mean that, that that's the ground for disciplinary liability and that is in line with the respective recommendations of the Council of Europe and the intention and the negligence uh, describe men's rare elements that should be proved uh, separately from the procedural appeal of the decision itself, and uh, so uh, we welcome our lawmakers on that. Additionally, as Venice Commission recommends, it is desi desirable not to exercise disciplinary liability, even if wrongdoing uh, uh, is uh, when wrongdoing is not uh, significant. So you have to establish minimum threshold for liability. We welcome this uh, opinion of Venice Commission, but uh, apparent mistake uh, for any uh, professional uh, in law is again, you know, not a very clear cut criterion. What uh, shall we do if uh, judiciary as a collegial uh, a body is subject of attack? Um, you're, uh, well, uh, Constitutional Court versus Ecuador, that was the case on that. That was on termination of powers of uh, the eight uh, judges of the Constitutional Court of Ecuador, according to the decision of the National Congress and impeachment of uh, three other national judges. That was the period of turbulence in Ecuador, and there was no lack of any uh, judicial guarantees. The formal ground that National Congress used to revoke the powers of the uh, judges was a alleged uh, uh, inadequacy of their appointment. When they were voted for in Parliament, it was the list of judges that was voted for. Allegedly, that's not provided for by legislation. And nevertheless, the um, uh, Supreme Court decided that uh, despite uh, uh, the fact that the list uh, of judges to be voted for is not provided for by legislation, at the same time, there was no evidence provided as to any action, administrative, legal, or anything that uh, should be uh, appealed uh, uh as a result of uh, voting for the list of judges after their appointment in March 2003 prior to the political crisis at the end of 2004. If the Congress believed that the appointment 
uh, were, were, were done uh, not under the law. It was not allowed for the Constitutional Court to perform its uh, functions unlawfully in the course of 18 months. The Congress could have uh, uh, used the impeachment procedure, but the law did not establish any legal grounds for the Congress to, to verify the uh, legality of appointment of judges and make the decision if a voting was unlawful. The intention to remedy alleged uh, mistake in appointment of judges uh, cropped up uh, in the course of political crisis. The court referred to the UN standards and the Council of Europe, though it was inter-American court, under which the judges could be removed only for the reason of their inability of uh, coping with pro professional duties or due to the conduct that makes it impossible. The court has stated that uh, uh, in personal independence protects every judge, and uh, that's part of their constitutional status that protects us from the potential uh, pressure on any authorities. Collective independence is aimed at protecting the judiciary, generally speaking, uh, versus other branches of power. So collective termination of powers of judges is an attack not only uh, on the independence of judges, but that's an attack on the democratic order per se. And the resolution of the parliament had a different goal that uh, was aimed uh, at dealing with the abuse of power. So methods of pressure a judicial are different in uh, different states, but the goal is the same, to show that judges can be controlled. Uh, independence uh, of courts uh, is of interest to those uh, who are aware what uh, lack of independence means. Um, independence uh, is needed for the rulers that uh, realize that they are ruling not forever and uh, following the loss of their positions as the rulers. They will need this independence of courts. But uh, when uh, people in power, they believe that they are there forever, and that's why they can resort to exerting uh, pressure on courts. Populism, that's part of my presentation. Populism uh, uh, trends, when we see now, are aimed at uh, undermining the system of checks and balances, and court is uh, normally the first to be attacked. Uh, here, there is the, the case of the European Court, uh, Aston versus uh, Iceland. The judgment is not final yet. It is uh, pending at the Grand Chamber at the moment. The applicant uh, convicted in a criminal case uh, complained that uh, the case in the newly established uh, Court of Appeal in Iceland was not heard by the tribunal established by law due to the violation uh, in appointing one of the members of the court that heard his case. The judges of the Court of Appeal were appointed under the uh, uh, list offered uh, um, to the parliament by the Ministry of Justice, uh, and uh, irregularity, according to the applicant, is the result of the proposal of the minister that excluded four uh, candidates uh, uh, from the list, and the Committee on Qualification Assessment found them the most uh, qualified ones, and the former uh, replaced them with less qualified, uh, according to the ranking established by the uh, selection panel. One of the four that happened to be on the list and uh, was on the uh, bench that uh, heard the application. Um, so the European Court in this case said that uh, if uh, uh, the, the, the position of the judge uh, is not established by law a uh, sufficient ground uh, to find uh, this as a violation of Article 6. And that's detrimental to the judiciary in a democratic society and to the trust that judiciary should inspire the, in the democratic society. When executive uh, uh, authorities uh, tried to ungroundedly subordinate the judiciary, here the European Court uh, supported the idea of division of powers. Hassan Altan versus Turkey. 
uh, following the recent events, the applicant, uh, uh, he is a, an, a journalist in opposition. He was apprehended allegedly at, uh, when he attempted to overthrow the government. Following his complaint to the Constitutional Court, it was established that for lack of any grounds except uh, his professional activity of journalism, his uh, custody was unconstitutional. Despite that decision, local court refused to release the applicant, referring to the fact that the Constitutional Court uh, was acting outside uh, its uh, jurisdiction. In this case, the European Court reminded that mandatory um, nature of uh, the Constitutional Court of Judgments was the ground for the European Court to establish that Constitutional Court of Turkey is the effective remedy. The court uh, stated that uh, when uh, questioning the powers uh, vested to the Constitutional Court to deliver final and binding uh, judgments, the local court acted contrary to the main principles of the uh, rule of law and legal certainty. So if the Constitutional Court uh, found that uh, this uh, uh, custody was in violation of the Constitution. For lack of any uh, grounds, the na uh, national courts uh, had to immediately release the applicant. And finally, when talking about independence of judicial, let me state another um, important uh, case from a different uh, jurisdiction of a, a neighboring country, that's the European Court of Justice, uh, Minister of Equality, uh, versus OM. That was the application as to European um, arrest order in Poland. The applicant uh, complained that uh, the extradition of the applicant to Poland uh, uh, would uh, subject the applicant uh, to violation of his rights. Uh, so uh, in the European Union, uh, the uh, principles of mutual recognition of high importance and uh, uh, everybody has the right to a fair trial. Due to that, uh, according to court, if uh, uh, dealing, having hearing of on European arrest order, there are uh, elements proving that uh, the right to a fair trial could be endangered. The court should uh, define whether there are fundamental reasons to believe that the person would be subjected to violation of rights if extradited. So European court established two-step test for that. First, the court should identify whether uh, there is a concern that uh, the system of judiciary in the country is not in compliance of independence. And if the answer to the test is positive, so there are questions so with regard to independence, then there is a second test, a second step on the test. We look uh, at specific circumstances of the case. Recently, German uh, court in Karlsruhe uh, applied this uh, judgment when uh, handling the application of a citizen of uh, uh, Latvia claiming that extradition to Poland would uh, violate his rights due to uh, lack of dependence of judiciary in Poland. Having studied personal circumstances of the applicant and having taken into consideration the guarantees of Polish colleagues. The court uh, approved uh, extradition, but the message was very important at the same time. The court said that the judiciary in Poland is uh, um, uh, seriously compromised. And uh, that's a real threat uh, for a violation of human rights. And only because the case of the applicant didn't have any political context, uh, it was just just, just uh, the uh, homicide. Uh, the court uh, said that th there is no risk for the applicant. Extradition was approved with uh, some caveats. The extradition was uh, uh, allowed, uh, provided the uh, German consular in Poland will uh, monitor the uh, execution because uh, the uh, judiciary in Poland could not provide uh, sufficient guarantees for uh, potential violation of human rights. So I think a similar judgments when Poland uh, uh, is going to seek extradition. Uh, so other judges and other governments will resort to this test that uh, were offered by the court. 
recently I had a meeting with the delegation of uh, the newly elected uh, parliament, they ask the question, what are the consequences if the European Court uh, recognizes that uh, the reform of judiciary was not properly undertaken? What would be the consequence? Well, to revise uh, a judgment at uh, the national level, what, what's next? No, the consequences would be the following. Well, that's the way of cooperation of you and foreign partners, not only on extradition, but on recognition of uh, Ukrainian judgments in other states. How trusted are you going to be? How requests of the Ukrainian side will be quickly responded by other states? All these are going to be consequences uh, of uh, the uh, uh, the, 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 the consources that, that you asked uh, about. And uh, sooner or later, whether it's Poland or any other states, uh, if uh, the, uh, w if you want to remain equal partners of your Ukrainian family, we all have to change our legislation at the national level to comply with the European standards and European case law. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are going to have a presentation of Mr. Rabinovich, and that re-echoes a lot of the questions I raised in my presentation. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Hanna. Okay, let's have a Q&A session. Uh, so that's the time for comments and questions. If you have questions or comments, start by introducing yourself first. Good morning, Tatiana Foley, National School of Judges of Ukraine. Thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, your fundamental presentation. Given the uh, case uh, versus Iceland and the concept uh, of uh, potential detrimental effects that could be caused uh, to judiciary by lack of uh, certainty or confidence that uh, judiciary should inspire, and given the Ukrainian context. We know the stages of qualification assessment that uh, judges were subjected to under the law, and uh, many judges have been successful through this uh, selection. But there is uh, a group of judges uh, that uh, High Qualification Commission, and that was the competent authority that undertook uh, this qualification assessment as to the as to meeting the criteria of uh, these judges to the position. Well, the Qualification Commission uh, d drew negative conclusion, but these judges uh, keep administering justice in the courts of general jurisdiction on criminal cases and uh, in uh, district administrative courts. And we know that uh, uh, there are complaints uh, submitted uh, with respect to that, raising the issue of impartiality and uh, um, they ask the question whether these judges c comply with the criteria uh, of their professionalism. Given the guarantees of Article 6, can we face the question? Well, that's uh, about independence and about professionalism. Can we? What shall we do with these judges? Because the judges have not been appointed as judges. Uh, 
uh, based on the procedures that existed uh, when they uh, were to be appointed. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, the, uh, the Qualification Commission said that they do not comply uh, with the criteria that were established then. Thank you for your lengthy question and interesting question. Maybe somebody appeals uh, the decision. Uh, based uh, on, on the criteria and, and the scenes that you've outlined. Then the court uh, is uh, to uh, assess a particular case. If the decision was negative and the judge remains in the position, so they have to look into how much they depend on that. If the decision was made that the person is not in compliance with the professional requirement, then that means that uh, this decision can be revoked too if the judge uh, makes the decision that the government doesn't like. That's one thing. Then the court should also look into the uh, qualification assessment procedure, whether that uh, procedure was in compliance with uh, all the standards. And the case of uh, Iceland that is currently pending um, with the uh, Grand Chamber, I think the judgment of the Grand Chamber should be very ex uh, extensive and clarify lots of the issues. We have uh, a lot of uh, uh, criminal cases against the judges that administer uh, justice at the moment. How independent uh, can this judge be if there is a case uh, uh, opened against him at the prosecutor's office? Can this judge be independent uh, on the prosecutor's office if the prosecutor's office has a case against him? So, well, uh, let's wait until the judgment of Grand Chamber and clear-cut uh, criteria in the situations like this. Thank you, Hanna. As you said, uh, uh, it's uh, important uh, um, that the judge cannot be dismissed for the decision the judge makes. Another question. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Monsieur Dmivska, for your presentation. You know, um, I could hardly breathe. I was so attentive uh, while listening to very interesting questions that you raised. Uh, that's of importance for the uh, Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court, especially the issue of negligence. It's hard to prove intention if it is a disciplinary liability case of, uh, against the judge. But uh, should we establish the criteria for negligence? Is it possible to establish these criteria? In our case law, we came to the conclusion that it is hard uh, to um, have um, hard uh, criteria of negligence. But uh, uh, we, the judges of Grand Chamber, we base that uh, on our life experience, uh, on our professional experience. And I think the judges of Grand Chamber can draw a line between a mistake and uh, serious negligence. Everybody knows that uh, while you know, the judge has a very good reputation. And here is the mistake that he made. And that's the mistake that is really strange. He've never um, done anything similar. So um, it's hard. I mean, you, you can hardly believe that it could be intentional. And there is an element uh, of uh, uh, entering into, into complicity. So should we be guided by our sixth feeling when assessing gross negligence and base this assessment on our professional and life experience? That's a very important question for us uh, when we deal with disciplinary uh, cases in the Supreme Court. Thank you very much for raising the term uh, the uh, severe negligence, which was actually highly criticized by the Venice Commission. It is quite vague, not clear. So this is the matter of degree. And you really have to prove, really to prove the element of guilt, intentional guilt. The fact that judges do it on the basis of their experience, their internal uh, con belief, but actually this is something that should be clearly proved uh, in respect to this judge. In case it is not, the presumption of innocence uh, encompasses judges as well. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Are there any other questions to Hanna, to um, Ms. Yudkivska? If there are no questions, let's, let's continue our discussion bef during the coffee break. Let's uh, make it a bit shorter. So um, we come back at 11.15. So we have 20 minutes for the coffee break, and then we proceed with our first session. Thank you.
And now we shall discuss the topic which is of particular importance for the development of the European system of protecting human rights and which is related to the standards um, for uh, detained uh, people. Uh, these issues have been interpreted in a number of articles of the Convention, but there are lots of cases uh, related to Article 3. Uh, here the court um, is talking about such issues as torture, inhuman treatment, uh, etc. So let's consider the conditions of detention in the case of the uh, uh, EKTHR, minimum conditions, pilot judgments, and effective remedies. And I invite, I give the floor to the judge of the European Court of Human Rights from Ireland, Mrs. Shafra O'Leary. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm not able to continue in Ukrainian. Uh, I'll be continuing in, in English. But I did want to say thank you very much to the organizers, to Judge Yudkivska, and to all of you for your warm welcome to Lviv. This is the first time I have been in Ukraine, uh, and it's really a beautiful city. And if I can say on a personal note, although I'm the Irish judge, I'm married to a Spaniard, and every summer I spend my holidays in a region of Spain called Galicia. So when I go back home on Sunday, I'll tell my husband that I've been to the real Galicia. <laughs> so I'm going to bring you on a little journey from Article 6 to Article 3. And as you know, of course, Article 3 provides that no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhumane and degrading treatment. And it's important to stress, as the Strasbourg Court has always done, the absolute character of this uh, article and that the fact that it enshrines one of the most fundamental values of democratic societies. What is at issue in Article 3 cases, as you know, is the very subject of human dignity. So what I will be discussing this morning is what happens after the fair trials, which other obser observers will be uh, discussing, and the link of this subject with the rule of law, which is, of course, the theme running throughout the day, is clearly underlined in your Pre-Trial Detention Act and also, most importantly, in Article 8 of your 2005 Administrative Code. Now, we felt that this line of case law is both timely and indeed topical in respect of Ukraine. Now, as you know, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights in relation to Article 3 is both very well established and sadly it's also very extensive. To date the court has found approximately 1,300 violations of Article 3 of the Convention due to the conditions in which prisoners are detained. And in addition many many other cases have been dealt with by means of the friendly settlement procedure or by means of unilateral declarations. In some cases, the court has found violations of both Articles 3 and Articles 8 of the Convention on account, for example, of the failure by the state to respect its positive obligations in relation to the provision of sanitary facilities um, or because they have recourse regularly to strip searching. And in many other cases relating to Article 3, you find additional complaints under Article 3 in combination with Article 13 because, of course, there may be an absence of an effective domestic remedy. Now, on the 31st of January 2018, to give you an idea of the population that we're referring to, there were over 1,229,000 inmates in the penal institutions of the 44 states of the Council of Europe covered by the 2018 Space Report. Now, this statistic translates for the European Court of Human Rights into approximately 12,000 pending cases. In around 9,300 of these cases, the main or the only issue relates to conditions of detention and Article 3. There are about 7,000 applications pending but frozen in relation to Romania and 1,600 cases concern Russia. For the purposes of this Lviv Forum, I'll concentrate on prison overcrowding and space requirements in multi-occupancy cells, on the minimum conditions required by our case law, on the need for effective remedies at national level, and of course I'll explain how the European Court of Human Rights has sought to combat the systemic problems in this particular field with recourse to pilot judgment procedures. And I know that this audience is very familiar with pilot judgments. 
having outlined the general picture under Article 3 of the uh, case law on prison conditions, I'll then turn to the specific situation of Ukraine and just give you an update on where we stand in relation to Ukraine. Now, the gravity, some of the problems which detainees, states, and the Strasbourg court have been facing, I think is very well illustrated by the data provided in a 2017 judgment, a pilot judgment called Resmivis against Romania. And in that case, the court referred to the fact that there was a serious structural problem of overcrowding in Romania, which had been identified since 2012, so five years prior to the pilot judgment. There was a resulting influx of applications to the court in Strasbourg, and I'll explain in the context of the overall discussion you're having why that should be a cause for concern. There was an occupancy rate for all Romanian custodial facilities which varied between 149% and 154%. And also the court stressed the fact that the majority of recent judgments concerning Romania had involved applicants serving sentences in living space of less than three meters squared and sometimes less than two meters squared. Now, what is the standard and methodology applied by the European Court of Human Rights in this area? Well, in its 2016 judgment, in a case called Mersic against Croatia, the Grand Chamber of the Court, after reviewing all the existing case law, clarified the convention standards for the assessment of prison overcrowding. It confirmed that the minimum standard of personal space is three square meters per detainee, a standard which most importantly applies to remand detainees and also to convicted prisoners. It clarified how to calculate that minimum space. You have to exclude in-cell sanitary facilities but include furniture. It indicated that personal space below this minimum gives rise to a strong presumption of a violation of Article 3. And to rebut that strong presumption, respondent states have to demonstrate the presence of three cumulative factors which are capable of adequately compensating for the lack of sufficient personal space. Now those factors can be summarized as follows, particularly the fact that reductions in space below the minimum are short, occasional and minor. Secondly, such reductions must be offset by sufficient freedom of movement and adequate activities outside the cell by the detainees. And thirdly, the detention must be in an appropriate facility. In other words, there may be a shortage of space, but there are no other aggravating factors uh, as regards the conditions of detention. The court also clarified that space between three to four square meters would constitute a very weighty factor in its assessment of conditions of detention. But in all cases, the court looks at cumulative factors. Now, the majority in the Mersich case highlighted the difficulties of setting a clear-cut numerical standard for the purpose of evaluating prison conditions from the perspective of Article 3. For the reasons explained in the Grand Chamber judgment, it set the minimum standard at three square meters, and it sought, very importantly, to provide domestic authorities with guidelines regarding how to proceed. It is also important to stress that the Grand Chamber of 17 judges was divided. Seven judges dissented rejecting the figure of three square meters as the trigger for closer scrutiny and preferring instead the CPT standard of four square meters per prisoner in multi-occupancy cells. In other words, for the dissenting judges, personal space of less than three meters squared constituted an automatic violation of Article 3 of the Convention. However, since the judgment in Mersich in 2016, this minimum standard of three square meters and the methodology very carefully outlined by the Grand Chamber has been applied in numerous cases since then. Now, I've just referred to CPT standards. How do the European Court of Human Rights standards and the CPT standards compare? And I'm aware of the fact that Judge Husseinov was previously the president of the CPT, so we have an expert in our midst. In Mersic, as I said, the Grand Chamber reiterated that when deciding cases in this field, it remains very attentive to the position of the CPT. And it is very important, according to the court, that contracting states seek to observe those standards. States remain free to and are encouraged to follow the higher standards of the CPT. 
as successive presidents of the CPT have said, and I'm sure uh, Judge Husseinov did this in the past, the CPT draws the line between the acceptable or desirable and the unacceptable or undesirable. However, there are two main reasons why the Strasbourg Court did not adopt the CPT standard as the convention minimum. On the one hand, under Article 3, the court is under a duty to take into account all the relevant circumstances of a particular case, whereas other international institutions, such as the CPT, are developing general standards in this area. Secondly, the court and the CPT perform different roles. The CPT engages in preemptive action, which is aimed at prevention, the prevention of violations of Article 3. The court, in contrast, is responsible for the judicial application in individual cases of the absolute prohibition contained in Article 3. And as I said previously, it examines all the circumstances of each individual case. Now, as I'll explain in a few minutes, when adopting legislation in response to Article 46 measures indicated by the court in condition of detention judgments, several states have chosen to go beyond the Mersich minimum standard. Following pilot judgments, for example, in Bulgaria, the minimum standard was set at four square meters, the CPT standard, and in Italy it was set at an even more generous five square meters. Now, a question which we're often asked is, how has the European Court of Human Rights handled such a large number of applications relating to prison conditions and overcrowding? And a question which I'll add for the purposes of this morning is, what are the consequences for the Strasbourg Court of such a large number of applications? And the answer to this question is found in the pilot judgment procedure, which has developed in Strasbourg since 2004. And a regulatory framework governing this procedure has since been included in the rules of court since 2011. Even when the pilot procedure is not followed, the court indicates individual and general measures to respondent states pursuant to Article 6 when violations are found. Now, I know that this audience is familiar with the pilot judgment procedure, or most of you are, and as you know, it was developed to identify structural problems underlying repetitive cases and with the view to imposing an obligation on the states in question to address those problems as quickly as possible. Where the court receives several applications that share a root cause, it can select one or more cases for priority treatment under the pilot uh, procedure. And I think the role of the pilot procedure and its importance both for the Strasbourg Court and for contracting states is very well explained in the Varga against Hungary judgment, which involved a pilot, it was a pilot procedure in relation to prison conditions in Hungary. In that judgment, the court stated as follows, and I quote, an important aim of the pilot judgment procedure is to induce the respondent states to resolve large numbers of individual cases arising from the same structural problem at the domestic level, thus implementing the principle of subsidiarity which underpins the convention system. Indeed, the court went on to say the court's task, which is defined in Article 19 of the convention, is not necessarily best achieved by repeating the same findings in a larger series of cases. Now, the Grand Chamber also indicated this in another decision which I'm sure you're very well familiar with, the case of Burmich against Ukraine, a case which of course followed on from the pilot judgment on Article 6 of the Convention in the case of Ivanov. And it said that a large number of repetitive cases, and in particular a failure by states to seek to resolve systemic problems in their domestic systems, risk encumbering the court and constitute a threat to the convention system itself. One of the key features of a pilot judgment procedure is the possibility of adjourning or freezing related cases for a period of time. But this is on the condition that the government act very quickly to adopt the national measures to, to satisfy the judgment of the Strasbourg court. In Torrigiani and others against Italy, and in Resmivis and others against Romania, for example, pending applications which had not been communicated were adjourned. However, this doesn't always happen. In the case of Ananyev against Russia and Varga against Hungary, pending applications were not frozen. 
And it's important to stress that not adjourning cases can constitute a form of continued or additional pressure on the respondent state to resolve the problem as quickly as possible. Thus far, the court has adopted pilot judgment procedures uh, on the question of prison overcrowding in respect of Bulgaria, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, and also Russia. In these cases, in all of these cases, it characterized prison overcrowding as a systemic problem arising out of chronic dysfunction in the domestic penal systems under review, affecting, and even more importantly, liable to affect, a very large number of people. In some other cases, which are not strictly pilot judgment procedures, the court has nevertheless provided indications pursuant to Article 46 regarding the need to improve conditions of detention with very concrete suggestions regarding how this might be done. And leading judgments of this nature have been handed down in relation to Belgium, Greece, Slovenia and the Republic of Moldova. So what should happen after a pilot judgment procedure? The pilot judgments in relation to Italy, Bulgaria, Hungary and Romania provide an illustration of this. Now, the organizers have a very detailed written paper which I sent to them and which will be available to you during the course of the day. I cover all of these countries in the paper, but orally I'll just look at the examples of Italy and Hungary. In these judgments under Article 46, the court will have held that the domestic authorities should promptly put in place an effective remedy or a combination of remedies, both preventive and compensatory, to guarantee genuinely effective redress for violations of the Convention originating in overcrowding. It's important also to stress that a compensatory remedy will not be sufficient redress in relation to persons who remain in detention. In the case of Stella and others against Italy, which was handed down in 2014, the court examined the measures adopted by Italy followed the pilot judgment procedure in Torrigiani. Now, in terms of timeline, Torrigiani was handed down in 2013. Stella was handed down in 2014, which means that the Italian state did indeed act very promptly after the pilot judgment of the Strasbourg court. In Stella, the court pointed out that a new preventive remedy had been adopted which specified that the decisions taken by the judge responsible for the execution of sentences on prisoners' complaints concerning the prison administration were binding on the relevant administrative authorities. Those authorities were obliged to comply within a deadline set by the judge, which in principle satisfied the criteria that judicial proceedings be ex expeditious. Failing this, enforcement proceedings could be initiated. Crucially, in the Stella case, the court noted that Italy had put in place a series of substantive measures intended to resolve the structural problem of overcrowding in prisons. It had sought to make greater use of alternatives to detention. It had sought to reduce sentences laid down for minor offences. And this is, of course, where national judges come into the picture. It had introduced organisational changes allowing prisoners more time outside their cells and it had carried out extensive works on prison buildings and con the construction of new premises. As regards the new Italian compensatory remedy, it provided for either a reduction in sentence or per diem compensation for each day spent in conditions considered contrary to the convention. Now, as regards Hungary, when the court handed down its pilot judgment in Varga against Hungary in 2015, there were 450 prima facie meritorious applications pending against that particular state. That number grew to 8,000 cases. And the reason why I'm stressing the numbers, if you think of 8,000 cases, that means the Strasbourg court is being asked to intervene on legal questions where the standards are very, very clear, where the problems have already been identified, where the solutions have already been identified, but dealing with 8,000 repetitive applications brings the attention of the court, understandably, away from absolutely crucial judgments, such as the Polyak judgment, which was referred to by the President of your Supreme Court, or indeed the, the cases on judicial independence, which were referred to by Judge Yudkivska. And this is where the importance of the pilot judgment procedures and prompt action by respondent states 
um, can be stressed. Given these particular numbers, the domestic response in Hungary to the pilot judgment in Varga was very important. And in November 2017, in Domjan against Hungary, the court held that legislation adopted in 2016, which provided for a combination of remedies, both preventive and compensatory in nature, guaranteed in principle genuine redress. The Hungarian legislation sought to ensure that complaints could be submitted to prison governors who had to act on them swiftly, that judicial review was available as regard the prison governor's decision, and that the provisions on per diem compensation due to unsuitable conditions were considered not unreasonable, given, of course, the economic realities involved. The effectiveness of the remedy also meant that applicants had from then on to exhaust that remedy. And in Domian, the court did indicate, and this is important in all cases involving pilot judgment procedures and effective remedies, that it would review its position on the effectiveness of the new remedy if in practice it was demonstrated that de detainees were being refused relocation or compensation on formalistic grounds or that domestic proceedings on these questions were too long or that domestic case law was not in compliance with the requirements of the convention. And this type of wait and see policy in relation to a new remedy initially deemed effective is not unusual, it's very important and it's not restricted to prison condition cases. Now, in these pilot judgment cases, the court tends to stress that it is not for it to indicate to states how to run their penal and prison systems. However, with reference to recommendations from the Committee of Ministers, from the CPT, and the White Paper on Prison Overcrowding, the court can engage in quite detailed examination of what may need to be done under Article 46. So that's the general picture regarding the case law of the court on Article 3, prison conditions, and particularly pilot judgments. So what's the situation in Ukraine? Now, the first violations of Article 3 in relation to prison conditions in Ukraine were handed down in 2005. And since then, almost 50 judgments against Ukraine have found similar violations on account of the inadequate conditions of detention. Since the 1st of September 1997, the European Convention for the Prevention of Torture and Inhumane and Degrading Treatment entered into force in respect of Ukraine, and the CPT delegations, including Judge Husseinov in his previous capacity, have visited various detention centers in Ukraine. The recommendations of the CPT have centered on the need to remedy overcrowding, the refurbishment of older prisons, and the provision of proper sanitary facilities as well as the need to ensure that prisoners have access to outdoor exercise space and facilities. At a number of its meetings since 2005, the Committee of Ministers has considered, pursuant to Article 46, Paragraph 2 of the Convention, the measures adopted by the government of Ukraine with a view to complying with these different court judgments. And during a meeting held in June 2017, the Committee of Ministers ministers examined the Nevmerzitsky and Melnik, my apologies again for my pronunciation, group of cases which concern conditions of detention and medical assistance in pre-trial detention facilities. And I should add as a little anecdote that all non-Ukrainian judges who deal with Ukrainian cases quickly learn a word which is not a word they know before and that's the CISO. We all learn very quickly what the CISO means. The Committee of Ministers noted that Ukrainian authorities, their commitment to adopting comprehensive measures to resolve the complex issues raised by these judgments. And they also noted that important legislative and institutional reforms were underway in Ukraine. However, in 2017, it did decide to change the classification indicator for these cases in the context of the supervision of the execution of judgments procedure. It changed the classification from a complex problem to a structural problem, given that it was increasingly clear from the court's judges, judgments that the issues raised were structural in nature and not confined to individual cases. And in December 2017, the case of Sukhachov against the Ukraine, which is still pending before the court, was communicated to the respondent government. The applicant in that case complains under Article 3 about the conditions of pretrial detention in the Dnipro CISO where he was held, I should add, during pretrial detention, which lasted for almost six years. 
the court has asked the parties in this case whether the case is suitable for a pilot judgment procedure and whether in particular the facts pertinent to the applicant's complaints under Articles 3 and 13 of, of the Convention it disclose the existence of a systemic or structural problem or similar dysfunction. Now, pending before the court at present are 32 cases in which the sole complaint against Ukraine relates to the material conditions of pretrial detention. In 81 other cases, complaints relating to conditions of detention are under Article 3 combine with other complaints about lack of medical assistance or complaints under Articles 5 and 6 of the Convention. And a significant number of complaints, about 25, have been received in 2019 alone in relation to the conditions in Kiev and in the Dnipro pre-trial facilities. Now, I understand that the reforms to which reference is made by the Committee of Ministers include what's called the concept of reform development of the prison system in Ukraine, which was adopted in 2017 and which sets out the general principles underlying the reform and functioning of the prison system. And I know also that a draft law on preventive and compensatory remedies for convicted persons and detainees who have suffered treatment contrary to Article 3 was submitted to Parliament in 2016. According to the latest information I have received or I have available to me, this legislative proposal has since been shelved, however, uh, with the government looking at alternatives. This is perhaps a pity given the fact that, as the Committee of Ministers emphasised, the, the need for reform was clearly there and the reform was, it was hoped, progressing along quite positive lines. We will, of course, have to await the outcome of the pilot judgment in the Sukhachev case and knowing how hard Judge Yudkivska and my colleagues in Section 5 of the Court work, I think the judgment will be not that long in coming. Perhaps some good news regarding the situation in Ukraine, and I think good news is always welcome, is that since 2009, the number of detainees held in CISOs has dropped from over 34,000 to around 19,000, which is a considerable and very positive uh, reduction. Now, I had wanted to divert very briefly and explain the case law the impact that the case law of the Strasbourg Court is having on member states of the European Union. And Judge Yudkivska touched on why this might be the case in her presentation when she referred to the EU principle of mutual recognition. What this means is that, for example, the EU framework decision on the European arrest warrants proceeds on the basis of this system of trust between the authorities of different states within the EU. One state will issue a European arrest warrant for an individual who is residing or temporarily or more permanently in another member state of the EU. And that state of residence will become the executing state as regards the European arrest warrant. However, if there is a lack of mutual trust between the different courts and national authorities in the system, the European arrest warrant system doesn't function. And in judgment seeking to ensure the proper functioning of this EU mechanism, the Court of Justice has very recently applied Strasbourg standards under Article 3 in cases like Mersich. I'll leave those details of EU law case law to the written paper, which, as I said, is at your disposal. Time to conclude. I think the repetitive nature of this Strasbourg case law shouldn't blind us to the fundamental character of the right which Article 3 seeks to protect. In a case called Samaras and others against Greece, for example, which was decided in 2012, following a visit to one prison in Greece, the Ombudsman of the Republic described the proportion of space to the number of detainees as being absolutely intolerable. Some detainees did not enjoy when standing even as much as one metered square of space. The CPT in its reports illustrate, not just in relation to Ukraine, but in relation to many of the other states that I've just mentioned, what prison life in these conditions actually entails. Added to the space factor are other aggravating factors. Poor light and ventilation, the absence of adequate sanitary facilities, fewer beds than inmates, little or no access to outdoor space, poor food and infestations of very different kinds.
And I've explained above why and when the court has recourse to the pilot judgment procedure and the significant improvement which those judgments have sought to achieve and which haven't, they have indeed achieved at national level in some states. Whether improvement occurs, however, will depend on the measures adopted, applied and maintained by the states in question, which it falls to the Committee of Ministers to supervise. Now, I mentioned at the outset a Council of Europe report from 2018 called the Space One Report. In terms of prison density based on the number of inmates per 100 detention places, Greece, the Czech Republic, Portugal, Italy, France and Romania, to name but a few, all registered prison density figures above 100, rising to 121 in the case of Romania. And in my own state, Ireland, which falls on the right side of the Council of Europe medium, one NGO recently reported that in a women-only facility, the capacity was at 196%. In some reports presented to a recent Council of Europe conference in individual facilities in some states, we, we see capacity running to 200%. And you can imagine what that means in terms of available space. I thank you very much for your attention, for your invitation to Lviv, and I wish you every success in your important work applying the Convention. Our court has repeatedly emphasized the subsidiary nature of the protection mechanism put in place by the Convention system. But what this means in practice is that the primary responsibility for compliance with Convention standards remains within the Member States, and within the Member States primarily with you, the national judges. And clearly, in the area that I've just been discussing, including in Ukraine, but as I emphasised, not just in Ukraine, there's quite a lot of work still to be done. If you have no objection, I'll take your questions, if there are any, uh, from my chair, because I'm sure that my colleagues can also help me provide you with the answers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. O'Leary. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Thank you very much for your interesting report. It's uh, really good that you uh, pay attention to the steps uh, taken by Ukraine in order to change the conditions of detainment. Ukraine has done a lot in order to uh, improve the conditions, particularly in the courtrooms, when we talk about the conditions of transportation, etc. And I have a couple of questions that relate to the topic of your report. First of all, there are lots of uh, convicted people uh, with respect to whom um, the court stated that there was the violation of Article 3 with respect to the uh, conditions of detain detention. And the court said that there should be a review of the Ukrainian sentences. The matter is that the convicted people really expect the sentences to be reviewed and cancelled. The convicted people do not understand that if the sentences are not cancelled, the term of bringing somebody to responsibility is not applied because it is applied by the court of the first instance when the certain sentence was produced. And such a number of cases uh, when our, uh, the court stated that Article 3 was violated is quite significant. I would like to listen to your opinion uh, regarding the possibility to uh, probably restrict the recourse of the convicted people uh, to the court, for example, when we talk about the category of cases when only the uh, conditions of detention are violated. And I'm sure Judge Yudkivka could add some elements. Of course, it's important to stress that finding a violation of Article 3 doesn't mean that states are under an obligation to release people who have been fairly, who have been convicted following a fair trial. That's not the point. They are under an obligation to find and apply an adequate preventive or compensatory remedy. Preventive means is costly. As you've seen from my description of the measures adopted in, for example, Italy and Hungary, 
We're talking about the refurbishment of very old prisons, the creation of new prisons, and the relocation of prisoners within uh, existing prisons. This is one of the reasons why I mentioned the statistics of the decrease of persons held in detention in Ukraine between 2009 and 2017. This is a very positive development because you're likely to find far fewer overcrowding problems given the reduction in the population. I think you're right to stress that the expectation that the conviction will be overturned is a, is a false one, but the need for an effective remedy is a real one. So if the person remains in detention, the preventive remedy has to come into place and they have to be relocated to a space which respects the minimum standards. And the minimum standards are fairly low. If you stand in your own bathroom and, and calculate three square meters, which includes sanitary facilities, you're talking about a very small space. For those no longer in detention, of course, the com compensatory remedy uh, suffices. But I think what you're referring to is a need to educate the prison population that violation of Article 3 does not mean release. And perhaps we could be a little bit clearer on that front. I don't know if Judge Yudkivska would like to add something. Дещо доповнить цю відповідь. Mrs. Leary has already uh, given answer, but I do not uh, clearly understand what you mean by restricting the right to recourse to the European Court. Really, lots of people have lots of complaints and uh, sometimes are this is one of the key uh, complaints, and then the court actually dismisses the application. Uh, for example, the Supreme Court does not uh, see any grounds for, re for reviews. So why do you think that uh, such possibilities should be restricted? Do you think that the Supreme Court is overloaded with such applications? Well, I will probably give an example. The criminal case was about about, included participation of 80 people. So 80 people were convicted. Out of them, one uh, applied to the European Court on Human Rights, and the court said that there was violation only uh, within the respect of conditions of detention. The convicted person asked, um, uh, referred to the Supreme Court to review the case due to new circumstances. The Supreme Court has, sees that there is only one violation of Article 3, and in order to uh, consider this case, there should be a um, uh, presence of this convicted person. And if there were 80 convicted in this case, it means that uh, we have to call and to ensure the presence of 80 people. It's necessary to uh, take the materials of the case, and if there are 80 of them, the materials will be about 400 volumes. So you can imagine what kind of load of work we have, and probably still we can predict that the um, sentence will not be cancelled because according to the European Court of Human Rights there was no torture, there was no violation of Article 6, only violation of Article 3. Therefore, probably we can suggest that the legislators, and I want to, to ensure your support, that when there are no other violations of basic articles of convention and when the uh, violation or uh, which was found uh, does not presuppose uh, just overturn of the judgment and when there are lots of uh, convicted people in the case probably the right to recourse should be to some extent restricted well then i do not understand why can't you take a resolution that there are no grounds because there are no new circumstances quite, uh, I would say, unexpected um, request. You just uh, take a resolution that there are no grounds for reviewing the case. And within the same context, when we talk about cassation appeal, and uh, in such cases when the cassation court sees that the uh, application is not grounded, but the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court when we already have the judgment of ICAT uh, HR, do not have such a chance. We have to start the proceeding and to clearly see the case. 
І я би хотіла ще раз додати до того, що сказала пані Дякую. And what the pilot judgment cases look at is precisely not only the violation of three, but also the violation of three and 13 because of the absence of an effective remedy. But that effective remedy is not the reopening of the criminal, which was not the subject of the Strasbourg case. So this is something that you can clarify at domestic level, because indeed, if you read our judgments, there's no confusion at Strasbourg level. Uh, this is why the draft law which was put before Parliament in 2016 is very important, because it prevents you being overburdened with returning Article 3 cases, but it also prevents these cases coming to Strasbourg. In the absence of an effective remedy, there is no exhaustion requ requirement. They have to come to Strasbourg, and Strasbourg would very much like that they didn't come, because we've already set out what's the problem, what's the legal solution. Thank you. Because this question, I think, has been has been uh, has, uh, has received an uh, appropriate uh, response. So nothing to add on this point. Uh, I have a different point. Uh, I thank uh, Shifra. <laughs> Uh, my dear colleague for the, for the excellent uh, presentation. But probably it's not a question to, uh, to my colleague, but it's probably a question to you. I'm not going to answer it myself. Um, I, but for me, it would be interesting to get your opinion. Uh, if uh, a judge, uh, which is to deal with uh, um, a case on, let's say, pretrial or request by the prosecution on pretrial detention, and the judge uh, has uh, sufficient uh, evidence uh, that the conditions of detention uh, in that uh, uh, um, pre-detention facility, CISO, or other CISOs, do not correspond to requirements of Article 3. Overcrowding, very uh, poor, deplorable material conditions, and so on. Uh, would this, uh, the judge violate Article 3 or contribute to violation of Article 3 if he or she, he or she decides on accommodation uh, and placing that person in a CISO not uh, uh, corresponding to Article 3 conditions? So what would be your position? Uh, should you uh, meet the request and send person to CISO or uh, not to send knowing that uh, you will be also guilty for possible Article 3 violation. I think my question is clear. Uh, uh, would be interesting to, ha to have a, at least a first instance court decision in Ukraine uh, where the judge will say no I'm not going to uh, uh, comply with this request because I'm not going to get involved in Article 3 violation by sending a person to such a CISO. Thank you. I think, thank you for your question. I think you have answered uh, the question already. It would be a very difficult choice for a judge, especially for a judge of the first instance, uh, because he will, be, he, will, he will have to decide whether to let go the criminal who may be guilty, who may be even a murder or something, murder or something like this, uh, and uh, on one on one hand, on another hand, uh, to uh, make this uh, person uh, and to violate the third article of the convention and to let him to be kept in the conditions which are inadequate. So I think it's a very a very difficult question. It concerns many countries, including Ukraine. Um, to to my opinion, to my opinion, uh, uh, the state. 
should uh, do so that the conditions of uh, keeping these uh, prisoners in CISO uh, should be improved uh, to, to the standards which were uh, now told by uh, Ms. O'Leary. And I think that this will be the decision of this question. But by, by that time, I think it would be very difficult and uh, the society and uh, all other judges, uh, it will be very difficult for them to understand why uh, a murderer, a killer, or maybe a thief uh, would be um, not imprisoned because of these arguments which you have told. So it's, it's, it's a difficult question. I don't think it has a quite a good answer by this time. I think that your question brings us back to our first uh, speaker today, to, the, to her report. Uh, this is the key point, what is the most important in this question. Thank you very much for uh, such a dialogue between the Ukrainian judicial, uh, judiciary and our European colleagues. Are there any other questions? I represent the uh, agent of the parliament, Andrei Mamaleha. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, ask questions. And actually, I have a comment to the report of Judge uh, O'Leary. We can state that the Ombudsman Secretariat is not that optimistic about Ukraine, unfortunately. Certain, um, certainly, there are positive uh, trends and positive tendencies. Since the year 2000, the number of inmates uh, was uh, increased from uh, 240 to 244. But actually, uh, when we talk about pretrial detention facilities, I think this is topic number one, because there we detain people who are not convinc convicted. And there are some additional guarantees about them, because once again, they are not convicted as yet. I think that uh, pretrial detention cannot be reformed, cannot be repaired or restored. Pretrial detention facilities sh probably should become our museum exhibits something like that. Therefore, all the requests of all ombudsmen are ignored, neglected. The only answer we have, there is no money for this. That's it, full stop. Therefore, this is really a huge problem. But I would like to address one more point. That's really good that you talk about minimum standards, three square meters per person. We have Article 11 on pretrial detention. And it also includes the norm, uh, which already does not meet your standard. It's 2.5 square meters. So we do not even have political will to increase space up to 3 meters, according to your requirements. And I also would like to mention the pretrial detention facilities, which are in the military conflict zone. In Lugansk area, we have one uh, pretrial detention in Starobysk, which is in the premises of former um, beverage plant. Believe me, uh, the conditions there are awful, are really deplor deplorable. And all the attempts to introduce amendments to the Criminal and Procedural Code of Ukraine about changing the territorial subordination of that institution in order to bring uh, these uh, people to other regions and to consider and hear their cases in other regions, unfortunately, so far is left without any intention on the part of the parliament and the president. And I do hope that such distinguished organizations as OECE and UN will once again uh, Address, draw the attention of the Ukrainian authorities to uh, the resolution of these uh, urgent issues related to the protection of human rights. Thank you for your comment. And uh, I see there is one more question. And Mrs. Leary wants to comment. Thank you very much for your intervention, uh, uh, because it's very, very important. Uh, when you come from our court and you visit a country to talk critically about a very difficult subject, you must also try to be optimistic. So <laughs> I'm also very grateful that you have brought to the table the reality on the ground. We're well aware of this. The first judgment was in 2005. It's now 2019. 
I think it's important to stress that there have been far fewer judgments involving Ukraine and indeed pending applications than some of the other countries I referred to. Remember the figure of 8,000 regarding Hungary or 7,000 regarding Romania. And all of the EU uh, cases which I and Judge Utkivska were referring to, these were cases often in involving Irish or German judges asked to execute European arrest warrants in respect of people being sent to Hungary and Romania. So the situation in Ukraine is bad, but if it's good news, it's not as bad. Reforms are absolutely necessary. And in the context of our overall discussion today, you see why reforms are necessary, not just to prevent violations, but also, and this is a little bit selfish on our part, to allow us do our job in respect of all the other cases where the legal questions are very important and the legal answers are not always clear yet. Uh, but I am very well of the, aware of the reality you refer to. The first step is reform at a legislative level and changing exactly that. The minimum space requirement of 2 to 2.5 is clearly not in line with the Mersich minimum standard. Uh, so thank you very much for your uh, intervention. Дякую, пані Валірій, дякую за цю статистику. Дійсно, статистика вражає, що 12 тисяч справ на розгляді Європейського суду. 1,000 cases uh, is a huge number, uh, I mean, related to the detention cases, but case law of uh, the court is developing, and it means that the states should bring their standards to those um, that meet the standards of human dignity. <coughs> There is no input, I'm afraid. Maria Lutsko, Международная комиссия юристов. Uh, one is that international monitors in Ukraine have reported that there are secret detention facilities in Ukraine, like SBU uh, security service facilities. So first question would be, has the court handled similar cases? And what is your opinion on that? And second part is that we have very pro problematic areas such as East Ukraine and Donbass. And it has been established that there is no rule of law or fair trial in that area but still hundreds and thousands of people are imprisoned. And uh, what do you see in store of the is, uh, ECDHR for such cases? What is your prognosis? Thank you. I think my fellow judges would agree that when someone says I have a short question, we always get nervous because the short questions are the most dangerous. If I was to give you an answer, we would spend the rest of the day and tomorrow and the next day. On your first question regarding secret detention facilities, we have case law on this. Uh, just one case would be Al Nashiri against Poland. There are other cases involving Lithuania. This is a known problem, and the Court of Human Rights has examined these cases. Uh, El Masri, which I'm sure you've heard of under Article 3, uh, these are very serious cases, and they go to the heart of the question of the rule of law. On your second question, you know very well that we have interstate case pending, and we have numerous individual applications pending in relation to that particular situation. And I cannot say more than that for very obvious reasons. But obviously, this issue is on the desks of many, many judges at the European Court of Human Rights. Introduce him. Uh, today he was one of the founders back uh, in 2012 of this forum jointly with Taras Poshukov Hudema. So we are very happy to see you every year at our forum. Thank you for our cooperation. Thank you very much. With your permission, I'll speak from here, not to bother my colleagues. Uh, Uh, 
I would dare and start uh, by widely known provision internationally that says that uh, to live in the society and to be free or indep independent, fully independent on it is impossible. And that's a kind of, you know, general philosophical, sociological statement that uh, as a representative uh, of theory and philosophy of law would uh, use as the basis to or before I get down uh, to our internal legal or international legal aspects of the issues that we have uh, on the agenda today. The Constitution of Ukraine uses the word independence with respect of uh, judges and judicially is used twice. In what article, that's Article 1 to 6, the state uh, establishes that uh, independence and immunity of judges is guaranteed by the state. Full stop. As to immunity, it's not the subject matter of today's discussion, though you know some things are becoming more and more popular with respect to the judges claiming that immunity should be mitigated, if not uh, completely lifted. But it's not what we want to discuss today. The second sentence in this article, uh, this part, part uh, two or paragraph two of Article one to six of the Constitution, quotes: "The government uh, establishes the following influence, and that singular is it plural? No, that's singular." influence on the judges in any manner and everywhere is a problem actually influence on the judges in any manner is banned full stop try and apply this rule given the fact that as we all are very well, very well aware of that's what the government proclaimed the constitutional norms are norms of direct uh, impact what is influence there is a trivial uh, adjudication uh, court hearing uh, applicant respondent uh, they are facing the judge start talking is it influence or is it not in the linguistic understanding of the word, in the wide uh, standard meaning of uh, the word, that's uh, a standard uh, scene. Is it banned? Criminal case, prosecutor, defense lawyer, they all um, address the judge in their statements, in the materials uh, they submit to, to the court. Do they influence the court through that? At the beginning of uh, any hearing, a judge and his her conscience is not tabula rasa that would start absorbing uh, anything, uh, i.e. what the parties are saying. So what is banned uh, by the government here, by the state? Well, when it comes to theory of law, classification that's uh, favored element that's procedure number one in the theory of law and uh, the manuals on theory of law are full of different classifications and it's hard to remember all of them as a first year student that's my teaching experience that tells me that so types of influence because uh, without the answer to the question what influence is it any influence 
is that every influence, uh, the, the, the uh, claimant, the, the responding uh, party, uh, is what is banned, uh, media, uh, TV, activists, uh, so-called activists, or anybody who would break into the courtroom, as uh, one of the presidents of district courts shared with me. He, heard, he, he had people that broke into the courtroom, and a representative of the uh, civil uh, organization that's a registered NGO. They tend to come to, to court hearings or different meetings to prove uh, something. Uh, for instance, uh, once we had the PhD meeting and they came uh, for the meeting to tell that the uh, guy who was defending the PhD thesis does not deserve that. They brought along the camera crew and they uh, asked uh, the judge who was uh, defending the uh, PhD thesis, they asked him, okay, what is law? That was the question they asked. To this judge. I was present there. I heard this. So getting back to influence, what uh, kind, what type of influence is uh, forbidden? So categorization, differenti differentiation of influence, types of influence. There is more to come. I am not going to provide all types of classification. We need to have uh, criteria and then classification. Well, let me give you two or three. If, uh, I'm not going to quote all of them right now. Depending on the uh, on uh, cause and effect of influence, the correlation of these two. Uh, well, what would be another criterion? Well, the influence could be direct and indirect, allowed and non-allowed, uh, lawful and unlawful, oral and uh, written, uh, tools of influence, subjects of influence. And you can provide dozens of different types of classifications. And uh, everything was okay with paragraph 2 of Article 126 of the Constitution, the Constitution of 1996. Everything in, was clear for everybody what is allowed, what is not allowed. And all of a sudden, the Supreme Court of Ukraine, back in 2004, goes to the Constitutional Court of Ukraine with the request to, to officially interpret the content of paragraph 2, Article 126. The irony here is the following, that the Supreme Court judges and the Constitutional Court judges then were people of the same generation. These are the people that uh, went to the same university, uh, listened to the same lectures. They uh, studied at the same law schools or universities. So the Supreme Court judges, it's not a district court, the Supreme Court judges didn't uh, have uh, a clear idea of this time of ban, and they requested the, their uh, um, group mates, uh, people of the same generation, people with the same background and knowledge, they requested them to clarify what kind of influence was banned. And on December 1, 2004, the Constitutional Court of Ukraine um, made the decision in short, it was on, on independence of judges, it seems to me. Well, it was a long title, but briefly, that, that was on independence of the judges. So the Constitutional Court judges resorted to the limited uh, type of uh, interpretation because this ban, this provision is really widely phrased and it would be easy to say that that's another um, example of deficient uh, legal technique or, or deficiencies of law making. Well, we all know, though, that the specificity of constitutional legislation is in the fact that it is very abstract, very general, very uh, non-formalized, but at the same time, our Constitution proclaims Another, I, I try to avoid uh, uh, harsh language, though I am uh, really tempted to, uh, 
to say fiction. Uh, well, the constitutional norms are norms of the direct eff uh, effect. So if that's the case, then try to apply it here with respect to paragraph uh, 2, one, uh, article 126, without any further interpretation, without any further detailization or specification. Just go ahead and try that. Uh, try to apply it directly. Well, nothing would come out of it. Uh, if uh, it does, then, um, well, you might face the European court. Uh, um, and then you never know what uh, the letter will say on that. So on December 1, 2004, all lawyers were happy to read about the type of influence that is banned. That was a huge step forward that uh, narrowed uh, down the scope uh, or the types of influences that are banned. But uh, this step forward, uh, I'll try to show that uh, briefly later, gave rise uh, to no less number of questions that uh, existed before, rather than providing answers uh, to the clarity of the content of this article. Two, uh, two accomplishments uh, can be identified in the uh, Constitutional Court uh, judgment. First, it dared, risked, and tried to answer the question, what is independence of judiciary or judges? And in black and white, it was said, it was Mr. Yugrafov, uh, who was a reporter on that issue. He was a member of the parliament. He was acting president of the court. He was a deputy uh, president of the Constitutional Court. Uh, 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 unfortunately, he died years ago, but he was really an honest uh, uh, guy. I don't know if that's his wording or that's the result uh, of the common efforts uh, and discussion in the Constitutional Court. I don't know if there were any dissenting opinions. It doesn't really matter. So that's what the judgment uh, says, uh, independence, I'll try to quote, independence of judges is their autonomy. Maybe that's sufficient, that's their autonomy, and uh, two, or what, what's more, that's independence on any circumstances except uh, for the circumstances and will of the law. So the judge is not absolutely in independent. It does depend on the law. And uh, when uh, the words lawful was removed from the Constitution, and that was the word that was used by the uh, that was used about the main principles of justice, and it was replaced with the rule of law. And with respect to the latter, there are heated discussions that are going on and have been going on. We used to to say the quotation that. Uh, my generation uh, used to, to hear very often, the ghost is walking around Europe. Right now, uh, the ghost of the rule of law is walking around the world. It's uh, convenient to hide uh, behind these uh, uh, words without providing any answer to what uh, the rule of law really means. Rule uh, over what? Let it be the question for theoreticians. But um, in the well-known criteria of the rule of law of 2011, initially, later it was uh, done in 2016, when the Venice Commission provided the list of criteria. Many of you remember the issues that we had uh, uh, with the translation of the criteria into Ukrainian. And Mr. Golovata offered uh, radical scenes when it comes to the Ukrainian language, the way it should be described. But it's not what I want to, uh, to, to speak about. If uh, a group in the society or an individual uh, believes that 
the law deteriorates his or her life, the law uh, is an obstacle in satisfying the needs of the person, uh, because the entire life of a person is uh, meeting our needs, and uh, they need a centered approach, and that's my position uh, since uh, 1985, uh, and we have a PhD written uh, on the role of needs in um, uh, law and uh, uh, legal settlement. Then the, the person would say, well, oh, wow, this law is contrary, um, well, this legal framework is contrary to the law. And here we draw a line between legal framework and the law. But in uh, this issue, so the Venice Commission, uh, as, as uh, the top organization, the committee of uh, ministers and other uh, Council of Europe authorities back in 2011, that was back in 2011. And uh, in 2012, it was even the UN that adopted the resolution on the rule of law. So it was the formula that is uh, uh, becoming popular and popular in the world, but in, Nobody provided direct answer as to the understanding of the rule of law. Just, just uh, uh, statements, just slogans, that was what was in there. If the law does not meet my interests, so as a person, as a judge, as an official, I would refer not to the law, but to the rule of law, because uh, in this latter phrase, you can put things that are um, good for me. In addition to law, independence of a judge, that's his autonomy, I would add uh, when adjudicating, when deciding on the cases, and uh, lack of links of the judge by any other circumstances uh, apart from law. And you could have uh, uh, stop here. And the second uh, important uh, deed, uh, maybe that's too a lofty word, but that's a step forward in comparison with Article 126 of the Constitution. The second definition that uh, the Constitutional Court offered is the definition of influence. That's our life uh, that is uh, going on under the influence of those who are around us. That's uh, individuals, parents, kids in the kindergarten, school, um, relatives, uh, everybody influences each other. That's what is called uh, socializing because society there's a system of links relations between members of the society be, between one and everybody so what kind of influence is banned when it comes to the influence on the judge so the second step is to uh, answer this question that was made in this document uh, yes the doctrine may have uh, some dozens of opinions, but the judgment of the Constitutional Court are binding, that cannot be contested, uh, and we have certain traditions, uh, so anybody can evaluate. Uh, so what does the uh, decision state? It, it states that the, it is the influence of on judges is banned. And then we have the list, the list of subjects who cannot influence the court. But actually, we can just do not provide, we cannot provide any list, but just state that it is banned to influence the judges for all the subjects of the society. But the list includes the executive power, the legislative power, the high officials, the local self-governance bodies, etc., etc. The citizens uh, are also included, the associations, so actually, the list is quite exhaustive, I would say. The legal entities are mentioned. So actually, everybody is forbidden to influence judges. But 
then it will mean uh, it will actually meet Article 26 of the uh, 26 of the Constitution. And then why we need interpretation? So here is the most interesting point: the influence on judges with a certain goal. So this is the barrier to differentiate between the influence and to distinguish one that should be banned. And it actually states the influence that is aimed to prevent the uh, and aimed at prevention the courts to perform their professional duties. Once again, preventing the courts from performing their uh, official duties. And then there is continuation. But I would like to talk about this particular fragment. Let's talk about any civil case. For example, dissolution of a marriage. So former husband, uh, ex-husband and ex-wife uh, try to uh, understand um, and who should stay with the child and try to explain with whom the child will feel better. So they communicate with the judge, right, in a broad meaning of this world, in a social meaning of this word. So they try to influence the, um, the consciousness of the judge uh, using their facts and using the situation. And uh, actually the goal is not to uh, prevent the judge from performing his or her duties. And generally, we understand that there is no X-ray and we cannot make an image of a person's consciousness and in order to identify his or her goal, whether it is objective aspect or subjective aspect. In many cases, you just cannot do it, you cannot understand clearly state the subject, subjective or objective behavior. Sometimes you can only evaluate the external behavior. Uh, for example, uh, one certain behavior of a judge indicates probably that he or she is not impartial. For example, if we take a, a female judge, uh, Every judge is expected to to stay objective and impartial. So this uh, criteria actually is even discussed in the European Court on Human Rights. For example, there was the case of Campbell and Fell versus Great Britain, 1984. And actually, there were four criteria of independence of uh, the judge that were discussed. There is also a tricky problem behind it. Those who uh, write about independence of the judiciary are the ones who very often are writing about guarantees and safeguards of independence. And uh, how this independence is guaranteed and safeguard, special orders, special grounds for responsibility. Again, the list is quite long, up to 10 types of uh, guarantees of judicial independence. But what is independence uh, of judiciary? It seems to me I, I so far I have not uh, seen any definition of independence of uh, the judge in the judgment of uh, the European Court. However, our, our constitutional and Supreme Court court are trying to uh, delineate what is the independence of the judge. So coming back to our uh, dissolution of marriage, so uh, can they, uh, so does it mean that we have to ban these parties, the husband and the wife, to uh, convince judge that the judge should stay with him or with her? Definitely each side considers that only this side is right, and they do not want to lie to the judge. They do not want to conceal something from the judge, but uh, they really try to influence the judge. So what is the criteria of influence? One, for example, uh, there is the extension. Influence aimed at preventing the court or the judges uh, to perform their professional duties. Uh, 
So this, but this is not the end, as I have stated. There is a comma, or, and this is just the top of the uh, mountain. And I am criticizing this uh, decision of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. But still, uh, before that, I have mentioned that, OK, it's a step forward. We talk about dialectism. We talk about uh, of the unity of contradicting points. And probably uh, this is something that ensures the development. And actually, this um, dialectics influences the Constitution influences the ju uh, judiciary. We cannot uh, avoid this contradiction, but how we should live, how we should work, taking into account these contradicting points, uh, or let's say um, the competition of these contradicting points. So after comma, it is written, so we remember the end. Uh, so the influence that is aimed at uh, pushing the judge to taking the illegal or unlawful decision. What is this? Uh, again, we have the uh, request of the Supreme Court to the Constitutional Court. And there is, it is one of the unique cases when the Constitutional Constitutional Court was trying to avoid answering this question, uh, and it referred to the article of the Criminal Code of Ukraine that states what kind of uh, decision is um, unlawful. So what is meant by unlawful decision? So does, do we have them in the Constitution? Uh, when, for example, it is stated that uh, the person uh, with respect to whom such decision was taken has a right to the uh, compensation. So actually, uh, the term was used a couple of times, uh, like uh, unjustified uh, or uh, unlawful. But again, uh, if we take the criminal code, uh, the several articles actually mentioned the word unjustified or unlawful, and there is a footnote. Nobody knows uh, who the authors of the footnote are. And it is written that unlawful uh, is almost similar to illegal. So this is the footnote. So if you introduce, why do you introduce two terms for one and the same notion? Unlawful, illegal. So when we talk about unlawful actions, uh, there is also unlawful activity or lack of activity. And here, this is a good situation for me as the teacher of the philosophy of law. With my students, I provide these examples. And our first topic is understanding the law. And I do not go deep into the problem. So what uh, decisions are um, unlawful? What decisions are wrongful? Or when can we talk about miscarriage of justice? or unjust, uh, unjust judgment. So we cannot talk different languages. Uh, we all know one very good statement of one of the politicians who stated before we go down to some specific issues, we have to address some general issues. And if we do not even have the common understanding what is uh, unlawful, what is unjust, or miscarried justice. And here we have the statement of the Constitutional Court that states that our influence is the uh, an attempt to push the judge to taking an unjust 
judgment. So what kind of judgment should be considered unjust if it is not unlawful judgment, but unjust according to interpretation of our constitutional court? Therefore, we have a number of problems already included into the interpretation or explanation of the Constitutional Court. And one more aspect related to the influence uh, on the judge. So uh, I will continue to what I have mentioned before, and this is probably already will be the peak of it. So the final statement in the definition sounds like that, etc. So mind, I'm talking about a definition of an influence which ends in such words as etc. I remember uh, one of the definitions for cold arms. Cold arms includes knives, different types of knives, knife, uh, knives, etc. And uh, it, it was the real ending of the definition uh, ending with the words, etc., and so on. Just imagine the uh, hearing, the trial, when the prosecutor states, okay, this is part of uh, etc. moment, and the lawyer says, no, no, it is not. So this is um, the interesting case for uh, students, actually. So coming back to this etc., this is the definition of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. Uh, the highest level of the legal competence in the country. So with my, uh, uh, with my uh, report, I just wanted to draw your attention to the facts that may be related to banning uh, the influence of the court when we do not give answer to the question what kind of influence is meant. Thank you very much uh, for the doctrine of the constitutional principle of judicial independence. As you know, the European Court handles with the guarantees of independence. So there is a set of codified standards of the Council of Europe, Venice Commission, the UN, the OECE that provide for a systemic uh, set of definitions uh, as to judicial independence. Let me quote uh, one of the definitions from the reports of the Venice Commission saying that uh, independence of judges, that's the necessity that allows for the court to act as the watchdog of the rights and freedoms of people. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A. Let's do that over lunch. And uh, you're kindly invited to have lunch at the Premier Hotel Nista. We don't have much time for that. We have only one hour for lunch. So we should be back here at a quarter to two. Well, one hour and uh, 15 minutes, that's what we have for lunch. But we'll resume our work at a quarter to two. Enjoy your lunch. See you.
Dear participants of the conference, I am happy to welcome you here. On behalf of the Dean of the uh, Department of Law, um, I pass his hello to participants of the uh, forum. We changed the agenda. We swapped uh, session three with session two. We'll have session two, but after coffee break. We live in the time of uh, internationalization, integration, globalization. We borrow different practices and introduce it in our countries. In 2013, in Ukraine, we saw the introduction of the plea agreement in criminal process. And uh, we have the case law um, with that respect. But there are several challenges there, both uh, theoretical and practical, and one of them is uh, objective truth uh, establishment balancing between public interest and individual rights. And one of the institutions uh, is uh, the uh, uh, finding guilty in uh, uh, criminal proceedings. The Council of Europe adopted the resolution and recommendations on these issues. And here they focus on the pros and cons of this institution. Today, we have a very good uh, uh, opportunity to listen to this experience, given the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And I think both the uh, Supreme um, Court uh, judges and uh, uh, representatives of other legal professions will be interested in hearing how the European Court uh, takes uh, the institution of uh, plea bargaining in the Council of Europe uh, member states. So let me give the floor to the judge of the European Court of Human Rights uh, from Georgia, Lado Centuria, who will speak on that. Over to you. I think you will agree with me that uh, listening to the presentations after lunch is not the best thing to do after lunch. So I am sorry about you, and I'm sorry about myself. Let me thank the organizers of this wonderful forum for this opportunity to be here and uh, to come to a wonderful city. My last time here was uh, 16 years ago in 2003. Uh, a special thanks to Hanna Yudkivska, who brought us all here to this wonderful city of Lviv. The subject matter of my presentation is purposeful. Um, plea bargaining was uh, applied in Georgia quite actively prior to 2012, and uh, that was the reason for the human rights organizations and uh, the international organizations criticized the government of Georgia for sometimes uh, unlawful uh, application of this uh, institution. Plea bargaining, I apologize uh, for speaking in Russian. I can't uh, make a presentation in Ukraine, unfortunately. I can't make any promises, but uh, I'll try and make an effort and speak in Ukrainian next time. So plea bargaining we are used to uh, speed up the process of administering justice in criminal cases, and that's the institution that is used in many uh, Council of Europe uh, states. You know this very well. When uh, admitting guilt, when admitting committing the offense, uh, Plea bargaining allows for the court uh, to make the verdict without uh, adjudicating the case. And that uh, allows to avoid lengthy adjudication process that is often related to uh, quite excessive financial expenditures and costs. In its case law, the European Court uh, several times uh, looked into the issue of compliance of plea bargaining with the European Convention, in particular paragraph 1, Article 6 of the Convention, the right to a fair trial. In the Srili and Suhonidze versus Georgia, that's the uh, key case 
in this uh, um, area, in, on this sector, the, you can um, access the judgment on our website. Uh, it is available in Ukrainian as well, by the way. Uh, in this judgment, uh, the court said that the common uh, feature uh, here is uh, the chance of mitigating the sentence of verdict that the uh, accused can uh, receive uh, uh, in exchange of plea bargaining or cooperation agreement. The procedure of entering into the agreement is uh, not considered to be improper. But if it is the uh, abridged version of adjudication that for the accused uh, gives up on some procedural rights, this uh, uh, this refusal of the accused should be clear and would be proportionate to minimum guarantees. That this case was the first case. Uh, that's the devil versus Belgium. They could found that. Uh, uh, plea bargaining is not contrary to the convention. In particular, the court stated that though the prospect of uh, uh, being uh, heard before the court uh, will uh, allow to provide uh, any other details, but this type of uh, uh, institution is not in conflict uh, with the convention provided Article 6 and 7 are abided by. So it doesn't limit the freedom of the accused and uh, it allows the state uh, to find criminal any type of behavior that uh, um, is uh, unlawful by law. For the court, uh, plea bargaining, in addition to providing uh, advantages in terms of the fast uh, decision that can be delivered, and uh, thus uh, this would uh, eliminate the burden of uh, 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 workload on the courts, if uh, applied properly, can be an effective uh, tool to combat corruption and organized crime, and thus will. Uh, uh, result uh, in uh, the reduction of the number of convicts. That was one of the justification to introduce this uh, institution in Georgia. The effects of fluke bargaining are additional the fact that uh, the uh, indictment uh, is made or uh, the, the verdict is made uh, under fast track uh, procedure uh, that uh, provides for a refusal from some procedural rights. It's not a problem uh, by itself because Article 6 of the Convention does not uh, create any obstacles on the uh, voluntary refusal from these guarantees. By analogy with the principles that uh, deal with the refusals from the rights, the court established that uh, the plea bargaining should uh, comply with the this criteria, plea bargaining should be uh, made uh, voluntarily by an applicant uh, fully realizing the actual circumstances of the case, legal effects, and uh, the content of the plea bargaining and the manner of uh, uh, concluding it should be under sufficient court uh, supervision. Three cases of the European Court uh, um, are worth uh, considering when talking about plea bargaining. The first case is uh, the is about admissibility of application of plea bargaining, and second, the prerequisites as to lawful. Um, application of uh, this uh, institution and said gives legal assessment of the effects of plea bargaining for other uh, parties uh, to criminal case. The first case is Devil versus Belgium, February 1980, the first uh, judgment on plea bargaining. The applicant, a citizen of Belgium, had uh, the butchery store and the inspection uh, officers in the course of inspection identified uh, violations in uh, um, price and policy for meat products. Uh, the prosecutor therefore notified the applicant about the criminal case instituted against him. And since that moment until the dis 
court decision the store was supposed to be closed but uh, Mr. Deva could avoid these uh, uh, consequences by paying 10,000 uh, Belgium francs uh, as part of settlement uh, otherwise uh, he could face financial losses due to the store being closed so he paid the fine but in his letter to the prosecutor's office he believed that the alternative to, offered to him was unlawful uh, European Commission on Human Rights and you know that until 1998 there was European Commission on Human Rights that uh, was handling the issues of admissibility of application and then European Court handled the cases on the merits so the Commission found the application admissible and uh, uh, said that uh, a uh, simultaneous I stress that simultaneous use of uh, peaceful settlement uh, and uh, adjudication that was accompanied by closing the store violated uh, the right to a fair trial in criminal case uh, that was guaranteed to, to the applicant uh, by art paragraph one of the convention. Secondly, uh, taken separately, the decision on temporary closing of the store was not contrary to the principle of presumption of innocence, innocence and did not violate Article 6 of the Convention. According to court, Article 6 of the Convention is fully acceptable, is fully applicable to the circumstances of this case. So plea bargaining is full within Article 6 of the Convention, and the applicant uh, was entitled to a fair trial before independent and unbiased court established by law. However, having paid 10,000 uh, Belgian francs as uh, the fine, the applicant uh, refused his right to be heard by court, which is not contrary to the convention. That, that was the finding of the court. Court stressed that though the prospect of uh, being brought before the court would strengthen the readiness for compromise of many people, and this way of uh, influence exerted is uh, not incompatible with the convention but in this case the applicant was complaining against other type of uh, enforcement namely the threat of immediate closing the store that could uh, last until the decision uh, is delivered by competent court that means several months and uh, that that's uh, the time when the applicant would be deprived uh, of the uh, profit uh, he could make on the store and couldn't pay the shop assistance and could use the clientele. The threat of immediate closing of the store was qualified by the court as a uh, coercive measure and uh, the, right, the, the refusal from court hearing by the applicant was uh, uh, made uh, through coercion. Therefore, there was violation of uh, Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Convention. Uh, to assess the presumption of innocence, uh, uh, which was the subject matter of publication that was uh, uh, found by the court ungrounded. Secondly, the uh, uh, Leeds versus Georgia, that's the key decision uh, as to legal assessment of plea bargaining. This uh, decision contains uh, comparative legal analysis and that's uh, uh, an interesting feature about it, of the legislation on uh, plea bargaining of the Council of Europe uh, countries on the one hand, and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it provides for uh, legal prerequisites for plea bargaining. The applicant, the former CEO of uh, joint stock company, and uh, well, his wife and to him were the owners of shares. We are charged with committing different types of offenses uh, in the course of privatization of the plant. The parties uh, uh, came into the agreement whereby the prosecutor sought the court of the first instance to find the applicant guilty without hearing the case and depose the, uh, the fine as sanction. The Court of the first instance approved that it found the applicant guilty and uh, um, uh, made him 
pay the fine. So the verdict uh, was not subject to, to appeal. In uh, the application to the European Court, the applicant complained that the procedure of entering into plea bargaining was uh, not fair and was in violation of the procedural uh, rights, paragraph 1 of Article 6 in, in particular, uh, whereby he couldn't appeal plea bargaining. So th that was uh, uh, Article 7 of the pr protocol. So when uh, entering into plea bargaining as to sanctions and at taking the obligation not to appeal, uh, it, the applicant refused his right uh, as to hearing the case on the merits. So therefore, the European Court was to uh, consider the question whether the applicant entered into plea uh, bargaining voluntarily, thus uh, uh, creating facts and legal uh, effects and whether the uh, judicial or, and legal assessment uh, was sufficient enough when it comes to the procedure of concluding it. The court uh, found that uh, the initiative of plea bargaining uh, was coming from the applicant and the prosecutor did not impose it. That's important. The applicant had a chance to know the materials of the case and it was uh, properly represented by qualified uh, uh, attorneys of his choice in the course of negotiations and uh, um, hearing on plea bargaining. The court, when assessing the legality and lawfulness of bargaining, uh, looked into the potential um, influence that could be exerted and and the applicant did confirm to court and the prosecutor that he was fully aware of the content of the bargaining and his procedural rights and legal effects of plea bargaining were clear to him and uh, he didn't uh, enter into plea bargaining under um, influence or under false pretenses. It was important that a written plea bargaining was uh, uh, made and signed by the prosecutor uh, applicant's representative and uh, submitted to the court of the first instance. This allowed to establish uh, clear terms uh, and conditions of the uh, bargaining as well as the negotiations that uh, were held prior to it. The court of the first instance was empowered to verify the proportionality of punishment uh, offered by the prosecutor and its uh, uh, reduction or revoking depending on the court's assessment as to fairness and uh, lawfulness of the procedure of bargaining. The court of the first instance checked into the uh, um, substantiality of the uh, uh, charges and uh, uh, punish whether the offense is punishable and that was done in uh, an open hearing. As to the complaint with respect to Article 2 of Protocol 7 of the Convention, uh, the court found reasonable to exercise the right to appeal uh, given the uh, bargaining concluded. While well, agreeing to the bargaining, the uh, applicant voluntarily refused his right to of appeal and his lawyers were supposed to explain to the applicant legal effects of this act. So in this uh, case, the court found no violation of Article 6 and, uh, as I said, the judgment is uh, the leading landmarking one on uh, uh, plea bargaining since uh, it uh, covers the legal assessment of uh, plea bargaining in Council of Europe case as well as prerequisites of uh, lawful and fair use of this institution. The third case, which is interesting for me and I hope for you, is the case Navalny and officers against uh, versus Russia. Uh, the Natsvishvili case was uh, passed in 2013, and the case uh, of Navalny versus Russia is respectively new, dates back to 2016. The prosecutor's office uh, satisfied the petition of Mr. X about plea, plea bargaining and uh, consideration of his uh, case. Uh, in expedient way. So Mr. X and the vice prosecutor really signed the agreement on plea bargaining. Among some other conditions, Mr. X obliged to actively provide, submit the information to the investigation 
of uh, Mr. Navalny participating uh, and appropriating the property of certain enterprise, the, his, uh, uh, his role in this crime, certain steps to implement this criminal act, and uh, his participation in set, several stages, like uh, agreement of purchase and sale, etc. So ev everything was included uh, into the agreement. The materials of the criminal case of Mr. X uh, were separate from uh, the rest. The first uh, person, Navalny, found about this plea bargain and submitted the complaint to the investigation committee and to the prosecutor's office stating that this plea bargain uh, violated his procedural right in the criminal case uh, started against him. He uh, wanted uh, the case of X, which was separate, uh, to be included into uh, his case. The prosecutor's office definitely uh, rejected his complaint. The investigation committee also uh, rejected uh, the uh, request for unification of two cases and the prosecutor's office stated that everything was uh, legal everything was fine the district court took a uh, judgment uh, in X case uh, it was really expedited consideration without studying the evidence uh, the court uh, uh, found X uh, guilty of appropriation this uh, assets uh, he was given four year imprisonment but what was important Important. Uh, the state courts didn't allow Navalny and officers to contest this plea bargain because they were not participants of that plea bargain. This was actually the key argument of the courts and the prosecutor's office. So at the national level, they were trying to exclude the X testimonies from the case from their cases. Uh, so it was uh, no success, and all the accusations of them were based on uh, X testimonies. By evaluating the plea bargain uh, with X, uh, the European Court stated the following. As far as plea bargain agreement, the court uh, early recognized that this is a general feature of the European system of criminal justice, and it allows the potential suspect to have a um, less uh, severe sentence uh, in exchange for plea bargain or in exchange for cooperation with the investigating uh, bodies. If, uh, as a result of the plea bargain, the uh, defendant uh, has the expedited form of court hearing. Actually, it means rejection of procedural right, something we have already discussed. In uh, therefore, uh, any uh, refusal from procedural right is established quite clearly and should uh, include at least minimum guarantees proportional to the importance of the case and should not contradict certain important uh, state interests. That was the statement the court included into another case, Coppola against the country. So in this particular case, the criminal uh, charges against Navalny and officers were based on the same facts than the that the accusations against X. So three person, uh, were, persons were actually charged with the same crimes. So we cannot uh, contradict that any facts established against uh, in X case and any legal conclusions in his case were directly related to the cases of Navalny and officers. Under such circumstances, it was necessary to have certain guarantees that procedural measures and decisions taken in a uh, case of X will not undermine the legality of our uh, cases of Navalny and uh, officers. That was of particular importance, taking into account that the applicants were actually legally deprived of the possibility to participate in the process against X because they didn't have any status that would potentially allow them to uh, contest, to complain at the decisions uh, taken against uh, Mr. X. Uh, earlier, the court stressed the most evident safeguards and guarantee that uh, should be met when, for example, 
The uh, suspect uh, case is a separate case. In particular, the obligations of the court to uh, stay away from certain statements that might potentially influence any uh, court hearings. And it was the case Karaman against versus Germany. So if the charges includes the particip participation of third parties in one court or in, uh, proceedings and the conclusions of the court are important for the cases of these people, uh, this point should be considered as a serious obstacle for differentiating these cases. Any uh, judgment when uh, we consider such cases as part of a specific separate uh, criminal process should be based on our consideration of all the other interests and the uh, persons accused should have all the uh, chances to provide complaints and the, they didn't have didn't were not given this chance another point is that uh, when we talk about res uh, judicata judgments, they should not be related to the facts uh, which were mentioned in some cases and when the person was not part of these cases. Therefore, uh, what uh, was uh, established in one case uh, should be limited with, uh, by some pr procedures. In other words, in this case, no facts established during investigations against X should not be uh, taken to the cases of applicants. And uh, again, uh, that was violated. Moreover, the procedure applied by the court in X case wo uh, was uh, quite speedy. The establishment of facts was based on plea bargain, uh, so it was the agreement on plea bargaining and not the court consideration of the evidence. Logically, the facts um, that were important in this case were actually legally recognized and not proved. So as such, they could not be taken to any other court proceedings on a criminal case. Uh, because uh, they were not thoroughly studied, they were not proved in uh, some other court considerations. So these two key requirements were not observed in this case, and the court agreed with the statements of the applicants that Leninsky District Court uh, in the city of Kirov based its decision with respect to X, in such a way that uh, uh, to prove our certain uh, particip participation of these persons uh, in the case uh, Mr. X uh, was uh, convicted. And summing up, we can state that plea bargaining agreements is an important institute of uh, any criminal law and criminal proceedings, they are widely applied in the European countries. Uh, this is the fact uh, which is important for the Strasbourg Court. So this institute is fully lawful, but there should be certain prerequisites uh, that should be observed for the plea bargain to meet the constitution. And among the prerequisites are there should be no coercion to plea bargaining. The second point, it should be under legal review and under legal control. And the third point, the facts established in, uh, in plea bargaining cannot be used against other participants of the criminal case that did not sign this type of agreement. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Mr. Lada Chinturia, thank you very much for a very interesting report. Dear colleagues, now we have uh, some time for discussion of the report and of these issues. Do we have any questions? Uh, dear Mr. Chinturia, please, could you please tell us? Uh, in Georgia, the Plea Bargaining Institute was uh, quite uh, extensively used till 2012. So what happened in 2012? 
In 2012, we had amendments to the Criminal and Procedural Code of Georgia, and certain standards and requirements were introduced, uh, which I uh, described in my report. So how does the case law develop after two, uh, 2012? The plea bargains uh, take place, but they are under legal review and control. And so far, we have not had any complaints submitted to the Strasbourg court. In Ukrainian legislation, the court are considers this plea bargain only under certain conditions. And apart from some other factors, the court should establish uh, whether the qualification of the criminal act is correct. And when the court uh, refuses, sometimes the court refuses plea bargains on the grounds that the qualification is wrong. So what is your opinion? Uh, should it be the same judge that will later hear this case, or there should be self-recusal? So do, can't we talk here about violation of Article 6 of the Convention when the judge has already interfered into the case by refusing the plea bargain. This is an interesting uh, question. For example, if uh, the plea bargain is concluded uh, and if it is uh, supported with the judicial decision, it means the plea bargain uh, comes into force and it is final. But if we look at it uh, at a different angle and if it's necessary to review this plea bargain, so we have to look uh, into the national legislation, whether the case will be heard by the same judge or by a different judge. But it seems to me still it should be another judge who did not participate in uh, the plea bargaining agreement. So what are the conditions for the plea bargain? Is the competence of the national legislation? So the Strasbourg court does not mention it. But the prerequisites I have mentioned should really be observed when we uh, try to conclude a plea bargain. This is from the viewpoint of the convention. If there are no other questions, thank you. Thank you for your attention. I know that the uh, right to a fair trial is a comprehensive notion, a multi-aspect notion, and the European Court on Human Rights is trying to develop it. And one of such aspects is relevant and sufficient reasoning. Uh, when we are talking about court judgment. Therefore, I uh, give the floor to Mr. Latif Hussainov, who is the judge of the European Court of Human Rights from Azerbaijan. Thank you. I'm happy to welcome all of you here. It is my great pleasure to participate in this uh, important conference. And I have been studying these lines uh, during the whole morning. Thank you for invitation. I uh, um, would like to particularly greet here Mr. Rabinovich, who was the opponent of my my PhD thesis. He has made a lot of remarks uh, to my PhD work. And after that, I decided to study human rights a bit deeper. And as a result, now I'm the judge of the European Court of Human Rights. So thank you very much for those remarks that, to some extent, outlined my career. I remember that the presentation was in the Institute of State and Law. So I remember you. I'm sorry, but now I will have to switch into Russian. And I do hope my report will not be very extensive. Uh, and I'm going to uh, discuss and address the issue that you, as judges, should provide relevant and sufficient reasoning in your court judgments. This is not only the requirement of Article 6 of the Convention, but this requirement is part of uh, other provisions uh, of different conventions and protocols. 
and uh, probably you will not have direct uh, statement, direct requirement like that in the text of the convention. So I will talk about the due process in a wider context. Definitely all the judges know that the due process is important. And I would like to quote two judges of the Supreme Court of the US who in the uh, specific opinion stated the following. If we had have to choose, we would probably choose the Soviet uh, material law, which was uh, duly applied for the procedures of our Anglo-Saxon law, rather than our material law that probably would be based on the Soviet process. I do not uh, wish us to live under the Soviet procedural or material law, which, by the way, I studied here in Kiev, Uni Kiev University. So once again, the due process is important. And in our court, we uh, check um, not only whether there whether uh, everything was right with the material law, but we also check uh, absence of any violations of the procedural law. When we talk about uh, process, we have to differentiate between the following. First of all, procedural obligations of the state are directly uh, provided for in the conventions, uh, convention Article 5 and 6, Article 1 of uh, Protocol 7. The second point. The uh, obligations of procedural character related to efficient investigation, I'm talking about Articles 2, 3, 4, uh, and even Article 3 of the first protocol, uh, the uh, voting law. And also, we have to take into account the procedural obligations uh, related to some other articles of the Convention, like Article uh, 8, 9, uh, 10, the first protocol, which are related to the quality of the state process of decision making. It can be administrative or legislative or judicial process. For example, in case Karaksonia and others versus Hungary 2016, the Grand Chamber found violation of Article 10 on the grounds that the parliamentaries who were the applicants were fined for their behavior in the parliament without being given any right to have their say, to be heard. In the case ABC versus Ireland, this is the old case, 2010, the Grand Chamber uh, referred to the process. It was actually a complicated case, I would say. So once again, the Grand Chamber referred to the process of decision making, uh, the abolition of abortion, and they referred to the fact that there were three referendums. This is the choice uh, of the Irish society, Irish people, and in particular that the referendum of uh, 1983 uh, was voted, uh, had the majority. Also, we have uh, Animal Defenders case versus Great Britain. Uh, in this case, the Grand Chamber didn't find a violation uh, of the Convention, uh, once again referring to the process that the Parliament has been thoroughly analyzing the question before the law was adopted on uh, the abolition of political advancement. This is the law of uh, 2003. Later, uh, the judges also by analyzing the issue and on these grounds the court uh, didn't find any violation. In other case that you know well, Hearst versus UK, that's L and Mackin case of 2005, f five, uh, the court found a violation uh, referring to the process uh, that there were no political debates uh, they have no uh, political debates since 19th century as to suffrage rights. And the judges did not assess uh, proportionality as to voting rights uh, for uh, prisoners. So the administrative, judicial, or procedural uh, aspects are um, of huge importance. And they could be decisive in the cases. Uh, especially in the borderline cases where it is hard to establish whether there was a violation or there was none. Uh, depending on the actual circumstances uh, of the case, uh, 
and uh, the uh, types of uh, violations in the substantive or procedural control. can be exercised uh, together. So in one case, the court uh, assesses both uh, substantive uh, violations and the process, or the court uh, can focus on the process only. Hunton versus UK, an interesting case, an old case, uh, but it's an interesting case anyways, environmental issues. It was uh, about uh, noise uh, in Heathrow Airport area during night, and the court found that uh, in the c case where it deals about the decision of the government on environment, there are two types of assessment that the court can undertake. Uh, the court can assess the decision of the authorities on the merits. Uh, it asks whether it's in compliance with Article 8 of the Convention or look into the procedure of arriving at uh, the decision. To answer the question with the proper attention was paid to the interests of the applicant. Based on this type of verification, on this type of a test, uh, so with the focus on the process of arriving at the decision. So the parliament discussed that the issue was uh, assessed, expert assessment was undertaken, uh, especially when it comes to noise uh, of the night flights, uh, noise made during or by night flights. The Grand Chamber, by the majority of votes, uh, dismissed the, the decision of the chamber that was made by the majority of uh, uh, votes too. But the Grand Chamber decision was uh, heavily criticized by the institutions in the UK, and it was another time when they expressed uh, their indignation with the uh, judgment of the Grand Chamber. The Grand Chamber uh, spoke more about subsidiarity and much in appreciation of the governments and changed the decision of the Chamber, uh, therefore. So uh, recently, uh, we see some kind of a shift uh, of the methodological approach uh, in the court from assessment whether the national act uh, is contrary to the convention towards uh, uh, the fact whether the issue was duly assessed by the national courts given the uh, obligations of the government under the convention and uh, in compliance with the principles uh, established by case law. Uh, so the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, looks uh, into the question whether the national courts could uh, could uh, incorporate the human rights standard at, at, in their respective countries. You know the reasons for this trend. Uh, all the, the, the declarations, Brighton, Izmir, Copenhagen, they all focus on subsidiarity principles. The court uh, is more and more consistently considering the subsidiarity principle. A colleague uh, Leary um, was quite right to, to say that you, the, the judges, are uh, responsible for uh, uh, enforcement of human rights. In other words, we, the judges of the European Court and you, the judges of the National Court, we have shared responsibility uh, for the protection of human rights in the European system. If the National Courts uh, can't cope with the task vested uh, on them, oh, in, let me put the other way around. If the courts cope with the task, then there will be less necessity for the European court to, to interfere. If the national court provides the reasoning that uh, uh, is in compliance with the criteria of the case law of the European court, then the court will need uh, serious arguments to uh, revoke by its decision or by its judgment the decision of the national courts. So the verification of the process of procedural control 
is resorted in the cases is resorted to in the cases when when there is assessment of conflict in interests that are similar uh, article 8 and 10 protection of reputation and freedom of expression for instance or when the court is to put up with the fact that uh, due to the circumstances of the case, uh, social economic uh, issues, for instance, uh, using uh, uh, public resources, when the court believes that uh, national system is better equipped uh, to make the decision. It might seem that uh, procedural control uh, that is uh, verification or assessment of the process is less painful than substantive supervision uh, whether there were substantive violations uh, for the guy for the government at least it's less painful once in when you find a substantive uh, wrongdoing or violation another thing if it is just procedural violation That's true, but not always. Let me give you one example. Martin uh, versus Russia. You know this case, the case on discrimination. The Grand Chamber, let me grab my what? The chamber used a harsh wording, let me call it some, against the Constitutional Court of Russia. Because the Constitutional Court of Russia, as you know, acquitted different uh, treatment of men and women in military service. The chamber said in this case the main argument of the Constitutional Court in supporting the limitation of the rights of the military, that's the uh, right to child care, was that the military service has special requirements. Namely, it uh, requires uh, uh, an interrupted performance of the military duties and therefore massive use of uh, child care uh, child care um, leave would uh, have an impact on the armed forces of Ukraine. That was the Constitutional Court argument. The European Court found, found it not convincing. The European Court uh, said that there are no uh, convincing evidence that would prove uh, that it would be detrimental to national security. There was no evidence provided uh, in terms of the studies uh, conducted or statistics to assess the number of of, uh, military that would uh, request uh, 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 child care or paternal leave uh, uh, and would stay at home until the child becomes three. So there is no evidence uh, that would prove that the number of uh, uh, military officers that would be uh, on the um, child care leave uh, uh, would, it would be so big that it would, it would de undermine the capacity of armed forces. So it was based on the assumption only. The Constitutional Court of uh, Russia was indignant by this judgment. And the President, Valery Zorkin, was just furious. The case was referred to, to the Grand Chamber. The Grand uh, Chamber was diplomatic. That uh, mitigated the language of the judgment. They gave up on uh, the criticism of the procedure in the Constitutional Court of Russia and said the following. There is no evidence that any study or statistical analysis were uh, conducted by Russian authorities on this question. When the court uh, found this type of procedural violation, it might seem that uh, the applicant should be happy, but it's not always so. You can imagine that the person who is seeking the court uh, uh, to establish that uh, uh, applicants' rights were uh, significantly violated, but the court found just some deficiencies. Something was not taken into account. Something was overlooked. That uh, affects the sum of compensation that is awarded by the court too. But anyways, that's the trend that we clearly see in the course of uh, recent years. 
substantiation or reasoning uh, of the national courts should be relevant. I don't know how to say relevant in Russian, and sufficient. So both elements should be there. It should be uh, relevant, so uh, pertaining to the case, and uh, sufficient. If one of the two is missing, then the court is uh, most likely find it a violation. Let me quote you an example. When the European court found that uh, uh, reasoning of the national courts was not relevant. Carvalho Pinto, an interesting case. Carvalho Pinto de Sosa Moraes uh, versus uh, Portugal. That's the full name. Uh, 2017. The applicant uh, uh, had a gynecological disease. She decided uh, to uh, agree to surgery. And after surgery, she had a health issue, so she uh, was restricted in moving around, and uh, she had problems uh, in her sex life. She was 50 then. She filed a suit uh, against the hospital. The court satisfied uh, the claim and uh, awarded uh, both um, uh, tangible and intangible com com compensation. The Supreme Court, when it uh, handled the uh, uh, appeal, reduced the uh, sum of the compensation that uh, had been awarded and, uh, uh, and uh, said uh, several interesting things. Let me quote one. Uh, ground why the Supreme Court uh, reduced the number of compensation. You should remember that uh, during this uh, surgery, the applicant was 50 and she had two children. So she was uh, at the age when sex is not that important uh, versus younger years. Uh, the significance of sex is decreasing with the age. That was administrative Supreme Court of Portugal who said that. In our court, uh, the applicant stated that the decision of the Supreme Court violates uh, Article 14, uh, discrimination uh, based on age and gender. A European court um, uh, delivered judgment in favor of the applicant by saying that the language of the decision of the Supreme Administrative Court cannot be uh, found relevant. European court quoted two cases from the practice of the Supreme uh, Court uh, case law of Portugal with respect to men. Uh, two men, uh, aged 55 and 59 respectively, went to the Supreme Court uh, complaining to low quality medical assistance as a result of which they couldn't uh, um, have uh, a good uh, sex life. The Supreme Court in all cases, in these two cases, uh, with respect to men, found that uh, the scene is that uh, they couldn't have sex, had detrimental effect on their self-esteem. And the court used, quote, that uh, lead to shock and uh, a psychological disorder. Carvalho, in Carvalho case, uh, uh, well, uh, our court said that national court uh, found that uh, uh, sex life is not that important for 50-year-old woman, mother of two kids, then uh, younger women. That uh, reflects the traditional idea of sexuality uh, when uh, the sexuality for women is more linked to, to giving birth to children rather than anything else. So uh, I would recommend uh, reading this judgment. Uh, uh, dissenting opinion of uh, Judge Yudkivska, excellent dissenting opinion on this case. The reasoning should not uh, be only relevant, but it should be sufficient. And there are many examples. I can refer to, uh, refer to one case. I often mention this case because uh, I was part of it. Lubin versus Norway. 
my dear colleague uh, O'Leary uh, made excellent work. Uh, Shifra and uh, a judge from Bulgaria and me, thanks to the uh, contribution of our colleague, we had dissenting opinion in this uh, case, we didn't agree with the judgment of chamber, and the chamber for uh, two, three found that there was no violation. It was the case um, about the following. In Norway, there is a system that does not exist in Europe. I sometimes uh, say that uh, they take into consideration not the best uh, interest of the child, but the only interest of the child. They don't uh, consider any other interests. They have uh, an interest in a system. So that was a vulnerable case. Mother did, doesn't take care of the child, uh, and the child is taken away from the family and is transferred to, um, to the homes where there is a foster mother assigned to him, and biological mother uh, is entitled to visiting hours or contact hours a couple of times uh, per year, and the time is limited. That was exactly what the case was about. The boy was uh, three weeks old when he was uh, taken from uh, his mother. The boy was vulnerable. She was not feeding him properly. She was 17, and uh, they uh, found that uh, the, the, the baby didn't feel well, and uh, that's why they, they took him away from the mother. Uh, several years uh, later, they found that uh, these visiting hours of mother uh, were not uh, good for the baby, and they decided to deprive her of uh, her parental rights and uh, assigned a forced mother to him, and a biological mother lost contact with the baby. Grand Chamber 14 to 3, uh, Yudkivska was part of Grand Chamber. Well, it was of different opinion versus uh, ours. Putin found that it was violation, but uh, uh, many judges referred to the process more than anything else. This case was criticized heavily because uh, it was organized deviation of court from uh, finding substantive uh, violation. So the forensic, psychological forensic was outdated. Uh, so it was not uh, properly defined what is vulnerable. Interest of the bi biological mother uh, position of the biological mo mother was not taken into account properly. They rather focused on the process and decided that, Gretchen decided that uh, that uh, reasoning was relevant but not sufficient. Uh, the, the reasoning of the national courts, I mean. When the reasoning was neither relevant nor sufficient, lots of examples. Here, Lithuanian case, Sigma Danis versus Lithuania, uh, 2018. Judge uh, Yudkivska was part of Grand Chamber in this case. Article 10, a company, the CNN company, in October 2012, in the course of several weeks, had advertising campaign of its uh, items. Uh, that was clothing. It was in Vilnius. Uh, they advertised jeans and uh, dresses. If you translated 
advertising into Russian, it would look, Jesus, what, uh, what type of uh, trousers? Uh, uh, Mary, look at this blouse. And there was a young man that looked like uh, Jesus Christ uh, was advertising that he had a cross and, uh, with tattoos, and the colleague in white dress uh, was supposed to be associated with Virgin Mary. Lithuanian uh, company advertising um, had a negative comment, uh, and it was found in violation of the Code of Ethics, Section uh, uh, Decency and Religion. The court uh, found that the argument of the National Court is neither relevant nor sufficient, since A, the authorities did not provide the proper reasoning why the reference to religious symbols in advertising was uh, offensive. Uh, offensive and lifestyle that uh, was not compatible with uh, the life of religious person is uh, not compatible with moral. They didn't uh, find any evidence that uh, Jesus Christ and uh, uh, Mary were used not as uh, characters, but just uh, as, as, um, as, as the um, uh, pause a feel as you know to sh to show emotionality, and the third argument was the following: the only religious group they talked to was Roman Catholic Church, uh, despite uh, a lot of other religions that that exist in the country. Fourth, if uh, uh, respondent was uh, correct that advertising. Uh, this advertising could be improper for uh, uh, Christians, then it is uh, not compatible with fundamental pr principles if uh, the rights of minority would depend uh, on acceptance of these rights by majority. So there was no proper balance uh, between the protection of public morale and the rights of uh, believers and the right uh, of the applicant to freedom of expression and belief and opinion. Sorry. Let me just say that when the court uh, finds that uh, the uh, national court uh, decision is not uh, well reasoned, is not uh, relevant or, or sufficient, then the uh, court doesn't believe that it should be uh, considered uh, this uh, with respect to uh, um, Article 6. Uh, Article 6 uh, is not uh, taken separately then. There are many examples when the court uh, supported uh, the uh, or upheld the decision of the national court, finding it both relevant and sufficient. E.S. versus Austria, for instance, uh, fresh case 2018, and uh, uh, three days ago, TK and as uh, versus uh, Russia on extradition of uh, uh, people of uh, Kyrgyzstan of Uzbek ethnicity. The court uh, found there that the National Court of Russia uh, duly notified and assessed uh, issues of extradition. So reasoning was relevant and the court found no uh, violation. ES versus Austria, that's Article 9 and 10. The member of the right-wing ruling party publicly said that Muhammad, the prophet, had and loved many women, and he married a nine-year-old, which is inadmissible, and the Muslims believe that he is a perfect Muslim and idolize him. but it in fact, the uh, prophet uh, was this and that, and uh, Muslims, believe, the applicant, believe that uh, it uh, it is derogatory for the the the, the, the um, prophet, uh, the, the the idol for a religious group, and uh, the Grand Chamber unanimously found that the process was uh, uh, of high quality. The reasoning was relevant and and uh, sufficient, and we didn't find any violation in this case.
As I have said, the due process is Article 6, but apart from due process, the court uh, actually applied the procedural approach, procedural control with respect to cases on uh, the right to protect uh, family life, Article 8, mainly Article 8. And in one case, the court stressed the following. It is true that Article 8 does not include procedural requirements, but the decisions of the national authorities should be well-grounded and should not seem or be arbitrary. Therefore, the court will take into account how fair the national process war, uh, was and uh, how it uh, uh, protected the interest included into Article 8. And we talk about uh, care of children, guardianship, uh, environmental issues, registration of uh, ethnicity. It was a Moldova case. Um, there were a couple of Russian cases. And the focus of the court was uh, mainly on the process. Uh, also, uh, the relevant and uh, sufficient reasoning is important within the frameworks of Article 5, Paragraph 3, when, we, when the court decides to apply arrest, for example, the case of Magnitsky, August 2019. There were a couple of violations, an interesting case, presumption of innocence is included, a number of other violations, Article 2, and in particular, Article 5, uh, Paragraph 3, applying arrest with respect to Magnitsky. Uh, the Russian side referred to the point that Magnitsky's crime was quite severe, uh, grave. Uh, uh, logically, the gravity means that he should be arrested before the trial, prior the, to the trial, and uh, they were uh, they suspect that he might uh, just escape punishment, run away, uh, probably he would uh, flee from Russia, etc. But the court didn't find these arguments as well grounded and relevant, particularly that uh, for arrest, everything was more or less clear. But prolongation of arrest, these particular arguments did not seem relevant in order to take a decision of prolongation of his detention uh, term. And it's really interesting that the Russian courts stated that there were not no changes, uh, so nothing should be changed. So he will be arrested, he will be uh, kept under arrest. And the burden of proof is actually on the applicant, while the European court stated that the situation should be changed. And every time you should prove, for example, when we talk about uh, prolongation of the arrest, it means that you should provide enough grounds for uh, applying this particular method. Article 10, one process, uh, was important. For example, uh, the year 2017, when one of the bloggers provided the comment uh, in the net, in the blog, uh, in the blog of another blogger that uh, it was about police. Like, I hate uh, police. Uh, they operate with uh, the buttons only, uh, they are garbage, and they are garbage everywhere, and those who uh, who work in law enforcement bodies are trash. It will be nice if in the center of each Russian city there will be a furnace, and all bad uh, policemen should be burned in that furnace. And the court stated that Article 10 uh, is violated here, because the Russian courts uh, focused more on the very utterance, on the very quote, and didn't analyze the general context of the comment. By the way, the context and uh, the direction of the comment was used uh, later in the Ukrainian case, the Institute of Economic Reform versus Ukraine. Probably you know it better than me. And the court stated once again that 
the state court uh, referred more to the words uh, flat, uh, deputy, flat in Kiev, and you have your place in the parliament. So they mainly concentrated on these issues, on this statement, but they have taken the words out of context. They uh, neglected the satirical tone of the publication and uh, sarcastic probably, and therefore uh, the uh, court uh, didn't find any violation. The fact that the state uh, courts uh, didn't balance the con conflicting interest and therefore the court uh, found some violations of Article 10 was the case uh, at um, the uh, Kherson newspaper, Grivna versus Ukraine. Uh, it, by the way, uh, still the chairman of the court was working even after the decision of the European court. But there is also a positive example for Ukraine. 2008, we uh, found one case unacceptable because we thought that the state courts actually were right by adjudicating uh, the case, and they not only differentiated between value judgment and factual judgment or statement of fact, and they also properly balanced the uh, conflicting interests. This is the case with Renka and others again, versus Ukraine. Again, this is the old case, 2008. Uh, when, for example, Tymoshenko was called a thief, and later some people were claiming that this is some general word, some evaluation, and it doesn't mean anything. But the court stated that no, this was the uh, blow to the Tymoshenko's reputation. This is this was the distortion of facts. Even if it is value judgment, uh, it's should be based on certain facts. Moreover, it was not only just value judgment, but it was presented as a statement of fact. Uh, two more issues here. Uh, well, I stated that my uh, report will be brief, but it turns out to be quite long. Unfortunately, I would like to address uh, two more issues. The first issue. You should read all the decisions and judgments of the Grand Chamber. You should know these judgments and analyze them quite uh, thoroughly, because particularly on the basis of the decisions of the Grand Chamber, we formulate the key principles and criteria and guidelines that are later used by the national courts. For, ex for example, you would like to uh, evaluate the uh, certain issue and you take the ready-made uh, judgments. For example, you want to evaluate how lawful was interference of the company into personal correspondence of the employee, but Vilevsky versus Romania, 2018, there are quite uh, clear-cut criteria and uh, for example, if you follow your cases uh, according to the scheme that was provided in the case of Grand Judge Chamber, everything will be fine. Defamation von Hammer uh, versus uh, Germany, Mohazalilov uh, versus uh, Russia. We substituted the case law, uh, which was 16 years old when the national court actually refuses to summon the witness um, as it was requested by the defense uh, in 2019 we added one more element and we already have clear criterion criteria and you have just to follow them and uh, you can uh, resolve the issues whether everything was fine and finally I would like to state that protection of human rights presupposes effective functioning of the whole system, of all the links of the system. Uh, I mean administrative link, judicial link, executive link. On the other hand, we talk about the uh, state courts, the European court, and all these elements should properly function in order to safeguard the human rights uh, 
in other countries. And my colleague, uh, he's the judge in Azerbaijan, uh, often asks me, how are you? Uh, how are the things in your court? And I all the time answer, it depends on you. But that's really so. In you work good. If you work in a proper way, I have less applications. So your your work performance influences my. So uh, the story of the European court, the performance of the European court actually depends on your performance. Thank you very much, Mr. Hosseinov. Are there any questions? I will uh, give a question and I will speak Russian because the original report was in Russian. Thank you very much for a very interesting report. Definitely the topic of methodology and in particular uh, that of reasoning is an internal topic, uh, really a deep topic. And the criteria you have voiced uh, are also important. I mean the criteria of relevance and sufficiency. So the question uh, sounds like that. Throughout my practice, uh, I mean, my work in the Supreme Court, I often faced uh, the issue whether we have to evaluate all relevant and expedient uh, arguments. We know the standards from cases Vitychenko versus Ukraine and Pronina versus Ukraine, that all the arguments, all the claims should be evaluated by the court. Or we can be limited by evaluating some obvious uh, arguments of the applicant that really uh, show some violation. Uh, and uh, certain de that certain decisions uh, should be uh, cancelled. For example, very often the European courts states that uh, s this and that argument is enough and some other arguments may should not be analyzed. So this criteria of sufficiency should be fully exhausted when we evaluate all the arguments and statements, or we should take only several of them, the most obvious ones, the most important ones, uh, let's say the weighty ones that clearly show that there was the violation of human rights. Thank you for your question. I think you have already provided a partial answer to your question. There is a precedent. Definitely the European Courts of Human Rights should not take into account and evaluate all the arguments. But uh, your question is about the due process following Article 6. What I was talking about, relevance and sufficiency of reasoning, is uh, slightly different than, for example, what we talk about uh, uh, in Article 6. Therefore, immediately at, at the beginning of my report, I stated that the due process will be considered in a wider context. And Article 6 uh, has this element of well-grounded uh, judicial uh, court judgments. So one element you have already mentioned, that the court should not take into account and respond to each and every argument. And, uh, for example, in a number of Ukrainian cases, the court stated that the courts should not ignore or neglect specific, relevant, and important arguments of the defense. So if the argument of the defense meets these criteria, the court should take them into account, otherwise it will be a violation. So this is an approach. This was uh, the case uh, versus Ukraine, the Chaparuk versus Ukraine, and the Chaparuk versus Ukraine. Yes, these cases. But once again, I'm talking about the uh, grounds under Article 6. Dear Mr. Kusain, as a follow-up on Article 6, let me clarify the following. The Convention offers a minimum set of guarantees and uh, uh, we right now said that uh, the court is uh, to answer to key arguments of the court. So when the national legislation uh, doesn't establish any additional duties for a judge, that's okay. But what shall we do if national procedural legislation uh, 
binds the judge to respond to all, not only key arguments of the parties. So what do you believe? Uh, are we going to observe uh, or comply with Article 6 if the judge is going to respond only to key arguments of, of, the, of the parties? Uh, what about national legislation? What's the story here? Under procedural legislation, the judge is to respond to all arguments of the parties. That's a relatively new legislation, and uh, therefore, I, I would like to clarify this thing. Article 53 of the Convention is clear when stating that it is a minimum standard that is established by the, conven the Convention. If it is uh, a bigger standard, that is okay. But if there's more guarantees that you decided to establish, you have to make sure that it should be in compliance with the uh, standards as per Convention. There was a case against the Germany. There were three dissenting opinions, including me. We didn't agree with the majority there, but that was the case when the question was raised whether the due process requirement covers uh, or is covered by Article 4.5, uh, that's revision of uh, uh, custody or arrest, the uh, person doesn't agree, have a corpus, and the court is to decide whether that's proper or not. In Germany, you can do that um, indefinite number of times. The person was convicted. The uh, um, judgment in the appeal instance did not come into effect, but he kept uh, going to court on that. When it reached the Court of Appeal, second instance, it said that we are not going to invite the applicant. We are not going to hear him. We know his position. He expressed that uh, repeatedly. And we need to listen to the position of the prosecutor. So the prosecutor expressed his opinion, and the uh, applicant did not. And the court said that since you decided to expand this and provide more uh, defense, or a pr b bigger defense, you have to provide for guarantee. What's the reasoning is about? If national legislation of the state believes that a uh, reasoning in the, the court decision looks like that, then they should take into account all criteria because there is legal certainty, there is uh, expectation on the part of the applicant. It expects that all arguments will be heard. And if it is not done, then it affects the fairness of the process because then he doesn't receive the, uh, um, the, the defense that is expected by him due to uh, national legislation. I'll take an opportunity to ask this question. My question is brief, but with clarification or explanation. A reason in our arguments of the decision, does it provide for individuality of uh, uh, arguments? Let me explain. In our case law, uh, we can have a, a separate decision that is in line uh, with uh, relevance and sufficiency of reasoning. But it, if you compare that with other similar judgments, it looks like a, like, like a template. Uh, so the sequence of paragraphs, uh, all the references, and all that, well, there is a lot of similarity. It's like copy-paste. So can we say that uh, the right uh, of the person to individual uh, reasoning is violated because the uh, person uh, hopes that this case is going to be heard as a kind of, you know, individual case. Do you understand the question? Because I'm asking in Ukraine. I, I think it's a very good uh, comment, but it's not a question. It's more of a comment. I fully agree with you. Individual argumentation, well, 
uh, actual circumstances of the case should be taken into consider consideration because uh, if, unless we do that, uh, that uh, would uh, deprive the case of individuality. How could you pursue the same plate or rubber stamp approach uh, to different cases? Individual circumstances of the case should be taken into co consideration when providing reasoning. I fully agree with you. Dear colleagues, any other questions? You raised this uh, issue, which is quite a cute one. You quoted the Irish case when on uh, two uh, applicants article found no violation on the article Eight when the Parliament came to the balance of interest between a ban and uh, uh, the ability to go to abroad and have a bush in there. James versus UK, there was a balance uh, there too. On the one hand, uh, the property it was only some property that was was uh, owned by the group, but at the same time there was a decision made by the community and the court said that we'll respect the judgment. We had Finchuk uh, Zitsura versus Ukraine, and there was also a Polish case where there is a, a balance and common understanding. If tomorrow we are going to have a referendum on a land moratorium, the decision is going to be against uh, revoking the moratorium. I fully agree with the uh, judgment in Zinchuk and Setsura. That was the right uh, decision. But if we have this referendum tomorrow, then the, uh, the, uh, the outcome would be against revoking the moratorium. So can we say that the European court has, is slightly biased with respect to new democracies. Uh, so the judgments made by old uh, democracies are trusted more than the judgments made by new democracies. Sorry, the mic is off. His mic is off. Thank you for the question. Excellent question. Great question. I won't be able to answer your question. I haven't said what I said. I, I think I, I answered your question. Yes, you did. My uh, colleague uh, uh, from Ireland wants to visit the Ireland school. I suppose Ireland would be considered one of the old democracies, but we're a particular old democracy. It's a state that was founded on the basis of a war of independence and then a civil war, and then we adopted our constitution which was in 1937, so it's an old democracy in some way. But the Irish case can be explained by virtue of the fact that it concerned the question of abortion, which in Ireland is a subject which has led to four, if not five, referenda, not just one, uh, the most recent being almost two years ago. Uh, and what the court was trying to do in that case very clearly, if you examine the judgment, is respect the balance which had been determined by the population and also by, not by the legislature, because the problem in that case was that the legislature hadn't legislated. Uh, and another curiosity of the Irish case is that there, there was a consensus clearly moving away from the Irish position, but the court allowed Ireland to have this very specific position on this very specific question, which was the question of abortion. So I don't think you can draw from the Irish case ABC a more general lesson than that. It was so particular and it's not just one referendum, it's a series of referenda and a social question of that sensitivity. Well, uh, I understand it completely. Uh, it's just that um, uh, you should be Ukrainian to understand how particularly we, um, uh, what our relationship to our land. Um, and I would say that it, it, you can draw some parallels between 
uh, Ukrainian understanding of what is land uh, to uh, sensitivity of the question, not the, the abortion per se, of course, but the sensitivity of that. I, again, I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, I'm fully uh, uh, behind this uh, uh, judgment in, in Chukotsutura. It's just that I wonder if we would basically apply the same standards uh, to that case, whether would we uh, come to the same conclusion. Thank you. Well, the, the, the presenter allowed me to take the floor. I can't agree with Ivan in the Linchuk case. The court uh, provided a detailed uh, criticism of the low quality of parliamentary process. It was because the parliament wasn't able in the course of so many years to explain what is happening, what was to happen, and why. It was particularly for this reason the court found uh, a violation. It's not a double standards. Let me give you uh, another example. It's not about well-established uh, democracies or old uh, democracy. Animal Defenders versus UK. We had a previous uh, uh, decision uh, that uh, Davis uh, Switzerland absolute ban of political advertising on TV in the Swiss uh, judgment the court uh, said it was violation of article 10 of convention the Parliament of UK when uh, it uh, heard the uh, law on uh, uh, banning political uh, advertising it was aware of the Swiss uh, judgment referred to it uh, analyzed it in detail and said no given all that we believe that in our uh, state, access to uh, politics uh, uh, for the people with a huge wallet, those who, who can pay for advertising, is inadmissible. That's why we ban it. And uh, uh, given the quality of parliamentary process, the European Court said, no, there is no violation here, though the judges that didn't agree with the uh, decision of the majority in dissenting opinion said that it is dual standards, why it is uh, allowed in UK is not uh, in Sweden, but the analysis was clear. We, uh, given principle of sub subsidiarity, we respect high quality parliamentary um, processes that was missing in the Lynchuk. Uh, case. Thank you. I believe that some scenes should be taken into consideration. The context, the reality should be considered. Five uh, to two decided that it was a violation in the middle of the case. And then uh, Grand Chamber decided otherwise. Uh, Grand Ch well, it's not 2015 when it is a sole judge uh, Robert Spano called it age of subsidiarity it became kind of trendy now but in any case if you consider the process parliamentary administrative or it is referendum there is one scene here the state was uh, undeveloped democratic traditions can easily have referendum or unanimously vote for some uh, uh, odd uh, decisions uh, and they can provide for a very nice and smooth process for that you have to remember that Dear colleagues, we worked really uh, actively and intensely in this session. Coffee break until 4 p.m. We'll continue then.
Dear colleagues, we are going to start in a couple of minutes. We actually may start, and probably some other participants will join us. So we start our final session for today, and the title of the session, Access to Justice, Recent Developments. As we are a bit behind our schedule, I will uh, uh, introduce our speakers briefly, and I would like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Mikola Hnatovsky, who will uh, present uh, the topic, jurisdictional immunity of the state and the right to access to justice under Article 6 of the Convention, current European court practice and possible development scenarios. Uh, Mr. Hnatovsky, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chernohorenko, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, uh, justices of the European Court on Human Rights, dear head of the Supreme Court of Ukraine, dear justices of the uh, Supreme Court of Ukraine, dear colleagues, it is my great honor and pleasure to be invited to this forum, and every time when I managed to get here and uh, have a presentation here, it's at the same time great pleasure and responsibility. When I heard from the organizers of the forum that my presentation should be on several issues of Article 6, I thought that probably it might be the opportunity to continue the discussion we started uh, at this university at uh, the forum which took place two years ago when I had a chance to uh, present a report uh, on the opportunities within the European system of protection of human rights uh, to restore uh, the rights uh, of people who suffered from the mil military conflict in the territory of Ukraine. At that time, several judges who were present in the room and who uh, represented different uh, courts of first instance actually asked me after my report, uh, both uh, in the course of the discussion and in the sidelines of the conference, what should they do in the situation when they get several uh, suits from Ukrainian citizens? And the civil suits are about uh, the damages they suffered as a result of uh, military conflict. These are lawsuits from IDPs uh, about the property they uh, lost in those areas which are not controlled by the government and similar issues. And at that time, I, well, I understand that there is the problem of jurisdictional immunity of the foreign state, which is a, se a serious obstacle uh, here. And the judges answer it, OK, we understand it. But at the same time, we know that the human rights activists, uh, advocates will come to us. And uh, in case we start uh, dismissing this um, suits, uh, we might suffer. Uh, for example, there will be less lustration, etc. So probably it will be safer for the judge to satisfy such lawsuits, taking into account that the respondent is not present, uh, he does not come to the courtroom, he does not recognize the uh, matter of the lawsuit, therefore uh, it will not uh, spoil the statistics because nobody is going to uh, complain about, to appeal this mm, judgment. So the judge is told that, OK, we are going to satisfy this uh, lawsuit. So, um, we were talking, uh, discussing the issue of international private law that actually forbids such issues. But the judge is told, um, you know, probably this uh, way is safer for us. And when I heard that there is a possibility to discuss the civil issues like access to justice uh, and taking into account that the audience here will be academia and judges, 
So I was thinking, why not to discuss the approaches of the European Court on Human Rights, because they have quite established case law. And I think you all know about this case law. And I mean, those who deal with the international law. But at the same time, probably this case law is not very much popular and known in Ukraine because there are no specific cases in relation to Ukraine. Mainly, the case law exists about other countries. Moreover, the European Court on Human Rights is one of the few uh, international judicial institutions or international courts that have, has a chance to regularly consider cases on the issue of jurisdictional immunity. These are quite complicated issues. and. Uh, these issues have been forming in the international uh, law through the domestic practices, through what is called committees gensen, like interna international uh, committee courtesy, and also through the general norms of our uh, law that were established through the work of the national judicial institutions, which uh, it's actu actually it's very difficult to regulate the activity of such institutions by different conventions. For example, one of the latest conventions of the UN on jurisdictional immunity of the state uh, that dates back to 2004 so far has not been ratified by 30 countries and uh, logically it has not come into force, at least for those states that have already ratified it. Therefore, the problem is really complicated and I thought the topic uh, would be interesting for all of you for our discussion and uh, if we come back to the lawsuits considered by Ukrainian courts. Uh, so I will address them once again at the end of my presentation, uh, taking into account uh, the uh, facts uh, of the case law of the European Court on Human Rights. Uh, definitely, uh, the international law uh, we presuppose cooperation uh, between the states, and this cooperation is also ensured through the Institute of Immunities. This institute is quite extensive in the international law. It has different manifestations. We can talk about immunities uh, discussed today, the immunity of the state from the uh, court proceedings in the courts of other countries. There are so-called diplomatic immunity and similar immunities uh, like uh, council immunity, immunity of the international organizations, immunities, uh, immunities of people participating in special missions, and a number of others. There is also another complicated issue which is related to the performance of the European Court on Human Rights, and this is the issue of the immunity of uh, top officials and heads, heads of states. These are different issues in the international law regulated in different ways. The most clear are diplomatic uh, immunities because they are safeguarded by the corresponding conventions, uh, conventions on diplomatic relations. And uh, even if we find, for example, some states that did not uh, ratify these conventions, still the, the diplomatic communities are considered to be part of the international law and are not compromised and not uh, doubted. The other immunities, like the immunity of top officials and head, heads of state and jurisdictional immunity of the state and its property, or as they are called, sovereign immunities, are probably the most complicated issues. The necessity to have such immunities uh, is based on the principle of the sovereignty of the state. One of the consequences of the sovereignty is what is uh, uh, equal over equal doesn't have any power, so it is a that phrase. And it means that the court of one state cannot uh, judge uh, another state and one of the uh, and logically there is no jurisdiction uh, of one country over another so that's logical mm -hmm. 
development of this institute uh, was developed through the Institute of National Courts and the practice of Ukrainian courts from the viewpoint of applying uh, these provisions will influence how the international law uh, will treat these norms, though these norms with us are well established. The paradox here is that it has been established in such a way that uh, case law uh, really uh, was important uh, in the countries of continental law family, while f for the countries of American law family, and it started in the uh, 1920s. Um, so these countries regulated it uh, in their national uh, system. And because of this, we have the uh, customary law. And it is reflected in the norms, in the provisions of the national law. We remember the provisions in Civil Procedural Code of Ukraine, uh, which were included also in the Commercial Code. Currently, the key norm for Ukraine is Article 79 on the international private law, and one of the parts would, of this article, which is entitled the Judicial Immunity, and it says that uh, filing the lawsuit to the uh, foreign state, uh, arresting the property that belongs to a foreign state that is located in the territory of Ukraine, application, some other measures, uh, and seizure of such property can be uh, can take place only uh, under permission of uh, that foreign state if otherwise is not provided for by another international agreement or the law of Ukraine. This is a classical, traditional, correct formula which actually uh, adequate and should not be criticized. The European Court on Human Rights has its own case law within the context of Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Convention, uh, which uh, with respect to the access to justice. And it is understandable that these provisions uh, to some extent uh, prevent access to justice. So when you uh, dismiss a certain lawsuit referring to the jurisdictional immunity, uh, I should be treated from the viewpoint whether it violates the statement of the access to justice uh, under Article 6 of the Convention. And the general position of the court from the very beginning, and it is understandable, was like that. It can be quite sufficient reason to, for example, uh, reject or refuse access to justice. And the court uh, stated that presence of the immunity and granting of the immunity should be uh, considered not as something that restricts or changes the material law, but as a procedural obstacle. So it is a procedural obstacle which prevents the applicant to submit, to file the lawsuit to the court. At the same time, the European Court on Human Rights has always stressed the necessity to check the circumstances that uh, caused such dismissal or refusal to uh, access to justice. And there should be a legitimate aim. and such a refusal should be proportionate to this legitimate aim. The formulation of the legitimate aim in uh, case law of the European Court on Human Rights, when we talk about jurisdictional immunity, can be summarized like that. Uh, the states should comply with the international law that enables uh, them to be in good co cooperation. That uh, comes from different uh, judgments adopted by the European Court on Human Rights. And the analysis uh, can be found in a number of cases. And for those who are interested in the topic, I would probably mention three court judgments that were passed uh, by the court uh, as far back as 2001, so quite 
a long time ago that was these three decisions were the judgments of Grand Chamber, Fogarit versus Great Britain, Matohini versus Ireland, and probably the most uh, important and vital case which was uh, hotly, which was uh, discussed in the court. You should actually read uh, dissenting opinions of the judge and So the judges uh, actually uh, were very emotional and were emotionally discussing the issue, which was reflected in their dissenting opinions. So that was uh, the case that it said. Al Adsani versus uh, Great Britain versus the United Kingdom, and it was about the situation when the applicant, who was the citizen of Kuwait and uh, Great Britain, uh, went to the British court with filed a lawsuit to one of the British courts uh, for uh, damages. He wanted to get the compensation for damages as a result of torture, uh, which he suffered in Kuwait. He was the pilot, military pilot, and he was protecting uh, Kuwait during the war with Iraq. Uh, and later he uh, remained in Kuwait, and he uh, possessed the video recordings of some sexual life of one of the uh, Kuwait sheikhs, who was a relative of the head of the state. Uh, after that, he was accused of uh, uh, making them public when they became known to the public. And uh, sheikh and uh, his supporters uh, caught him, brought him to one of their palaces, and they were torturing him there. They uh, were burning him. Uh, they were just, uh, and the burns were 25 percent of the surface of the body. So the case was really uh, evident. And uh, in all these cases, the Grand Chamber uh, established its position. And according to this position, the jurisdictional immunities are the grounds to refuse uh, access to justice. And uh, in the first case, th this, this was about labor relations. But when we talk about al case, even the very fact that the court uh, agrees that the tortures uh, are forbidden and this uh, ban is of imperative character, still this is the matter of material law, there is procedural obstacle, and due to this, the British court, the British uh, cour courts of appeal actually refused, uh, dismissed his case, while the first instance courts, uh, court actually satisfied his lawsuit. And uh, so that was uh, why uh, there were so hot de debates and discussions, because several arguments uh, actually were given. So one argument why the position of the court is wrong is quite emotional, and this argument states that tortures uh, is a topic when sh there should not be any obstacles to justice. The arguments uh, that actually supported the decision of the Grand Chamber, uh, uh, this were the arguments of the other judges, uh, were several of them. So one was the requirement of realism, the court should be realistic, and just imagine that every victim of torture that comes from abroad, and unfortunately there may be a number of such people, particularly when we talk about Western European countries, uh, actually they receive lots of migrants, and if all these people will file lawsuits, and if we satisfy all these lawsuits, how we are going to execute the judgments, how will it influence the interstate relationships, so the realistic approach was number one. The second approach uh, was about uh, judicial restraint. Uh, 
that there should be some ruling approach. And as this is the issue of general international law, and the European Court on Human Rights is the international judicial institution, still it should be attentive to the development of events in the international law and should not try to influence and modify the international law. It is not the function of the European Court to change something which is a generally recognized norm. It is interesting that uh, though these torture issues were uh, somehow um, resolved and there was no change of practice there, but the practice in relation to labor arguments is changing. And there are some typical arguments and disputes uh, when we talk about the situation when a foreign state employs a person, for example, to work in um, uh, the embassy or diplomatic institution, and the person should perform some administrative functions. So the person is not involved in some power-related uh, issues, etc. So the Jurisdictional uh, Immunity Institute is really developed, and uh, we remember the time when uh, the key approach was that of absolute immunity. Now we take a restricted approach to immunity, and that approach uh, is states that we have to differentiate between the nature of acts, we are talking about there are certain uh, acts uh, of uh, Euro Imperia that uh, go from uh, sovereign powers of the state, and there are acts of Euro Distillonius, and uh, they are of commercial or private or economic character, so they are not related to direct sovereign powers of the state. And in this second case, it is considered that uh, there could be an exception made from the principle of the immunity uh, due to the point that the state uh, in the territory of another state is involved in some other activities, be it commercial activity or any other that is not related to the sovereign power of the state. And starting with the case uh, Tsudak versus Lithuania, the Grand Chamber, uh, determined an approach, and according to this approach, if there are no sovereign functions, uh, actually in that case a person was working as a telephone operator, uh, some technical was performing some technical functions. So uh, in that case, it was not considered a reason to apply jurisdictional immunity. And uh, as a result, uh, Lithuania uh, was found as the country that violated Article 6 uh, of the Convention with respect to access to justice. There were similar cases, NACO versus Lithuania and Sweden. And again, Lithuania was found uh, guilty, was found as uh, the country that violated Article 6, Paragraph 1. So though it may sound paradoxical, it's much easier to get um, judicial safeguards in, in the case when you were dismissed, not in a very legal way, than in case when you were tortured. Unfortunately, that's so. And currently, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights is like that, as far as I understand it. How this practice might develop in future is an interesting um, case because the pressure on the European Court or f f just inside the European Court to make some exceptions from the principle of jurisdictional immunity will grow. And I think under current conditions, probably uh, we won't see uh, changes, but the question will be open. Uh, I mean, the question uh, uh, about the uh, connection of uh, the uh, essence of law and the procedural obstacles to protect that right. So I'm not going to go deeper into this issue. 
and still we uh, talk about international law. So it is interesting how the European Court uh, is uh, talking about uh, some customary law, or uh, how it refers to the convention, which so far um, uh, doesn't, didn't come into force. And you can read something like that. Though the state didn't ratify the convention, at the General Assembly of the UN, it voted for the convention. So uh, we uh, do not have objections here and to be open my private opinion is that this argumentation is uh, problematic and if the european court on human rights applies article 11 i'm talking about this case on labor relations and when it quotes the convention that was not uh, enacted uh, and uh, states that the country violated uh, some articles of the convention so you feel a bit ironic some irony here and uh, the position uh, on torture so far is not changed and finally i understand that we are to some extent uh, restricted in terms of time so let's come back to the ukrainian situation and to our lawsuits uh, you know that there are some public organizations, non-government organizations that specialize in such lawsuits. I don't have any questions as to their good intentions and I'm not uh, criticizing them or anything like that. I'm not accusing them of uh, anything evil. I uh, do realize that they are trying to find answers uh, to the questions uh, and the answers don't exist. Eh? Um, unless the conclusion is made uh, as to the imperative ban of torture, there are no reasons uh, to believe that the exceptions can be made as to the violations of other norms of inter national law as the reason not to uh, resort to uh, uh, jurisdictional immunities with respect to this uh, state. Uh, the violation of the use of force of international relations, for instance, uh, is that the reason? I don't think that's the ground at the moment. Uh, additional imperative nature of a ban to resort to the use of so force in international relations is more questionable uh, uh, versus the ban of uh, uh, torture. If nobody argues with respect to banning the torture, when it comes to the violation of the ban of the use of force, uh, does cause some uh, uh, doubts. And uh, to conclude, in the claim against the Russian Federation that is contrary to Article 85, uh, uh, the international um, law are satis is satisfied by the courts of the first instance. The thing that is the most concerning for me is the uh, um, situation of the uh, applicant, uh, the individual that lost everything or a lot as a result of the armed conflict that does cherish illusions that uh, he filed the claim to the court and uh, uh, will get compensated. The compensation is awarded. Some some some, uh, some uh, compensation is awarded, and the person is not going to get it. If uh, it is going to receive something, that's going to be not as a result of this uh, uh, suit. Article six of the European Court uh, is uh, clearly interpreted by the European Court as the one that is uh, aimed at real rather than illusory uh, protection of human. Rights. That's the example of illusory, illusory protection. These are that that's the decision that cannot be uh, executed and it's covered by Article 6, uh, similar to access to court. So that's the borderline case of jurisprudence and morale uh, as to the possibility and encouraging filing similar uh, suits. I'll stop here. We'll appreciate your questions. Thank you. Thank you, McCullough, for a very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, keeping up the time frame. Dear colleagues, please ask questions. Uh, those who did not ask any questions, there is a unique opportunity.
Thank you, Mikola. Can I ask it in Russian? Thank you for a very interesting presentation. That was uh, the presentation that covered uh, international law and uh, human rights and uh, the right to a fair trial. There was uh, one case uh, of Grand Chamber. You didn't mention it because that's not directly related to the issues covered by you, uh, Kliman versus Switzerland. The individual was tortured in Tunisia and in Switzerland. He went uh, to court uh, to uh, receive the compensation, but uh, the courts in Switzerland did not uh, accept his claim for consideration, and he went uh, to the European Court uh, claiming a violation his uh, access to a fair trial to court. Uh, so there is a criminal element here, universal ban of torture. You just go against uh, norm, ergo omnes, uh, wonderful statements, wonderful terms. That's why they referred uh, to that, but they were disappointed with this approach of the court. On the one hand, uh, we uh, speak about a universal ban of torture, uh, ergo omnes, nobody can resort to torture to, uh, in, in any case, that's a universal uh, jurisdiction. Does it cover a civil aspect when it comes to compensation claims? The UN Convention and the European Convention, the, their correlation. It's hard. It's not really a question. Let me draw a parallel. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, when it comes to civil aspects of that, this case is of interest. It doesn't really matter what I think about it, whether I like it or not. But uh, uh, from my perspective, in the future, European Court uh, will change its position. If you want to be effective in eliminating torture, then you have to make this jurisdiction universal. Otherwise, these words, uh, absolute uh, ban and universal jurisdiction, is going to be, as you said, illusory uh, protection rather than practical. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Uh, that was comment slash question. Well, there is a criminal aspect uh, here at the beginning I uh, mentioned uh, that I'm going to focus on the civil one. When it comes to criminal legal aspects, the, the situation is a little bit simpler there in a way. Why? Because universal jurisdiction with respect uh, to torture inter alia and uh, other uh, serious uh, offenses, uh, genocide, uh, 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 crimes against humanity, military uh, crimes, that's all that is re well recognized under international law. And do we uh, speak about criminal liability of specific, specific individuals? Unless that's uh, uh, higher officials of the state that enjoy different uh, immunity and the status of senior officials, then national uh, uh, pr prosecution is a very good idea, right idea. But uh, the efficiency principle should be abided by anyways, because uh, within the universal jurisdiction, if you file a large number of uh, criminal cases or start investigating into them and uh, charge people that uh, uh, will never 
be sentenced, then that's all pointless because uh, the list of these uh, people is basically uh, limitless. And uh, another thing is if the person is located on the territory of the state, then there is a chance to do that. Though there are different immunities here. When you talk about the leadership of the state, there is respective practice on that. The aspect that uh, I didn't uh, have time to mention, that's uh, the dialogue of the European Court of Human Rights and International UN Court, because uh, from the point of view of jurisdictional immunities on civil cases, there is international uh, Court, uh, Germany versus Italy on jurisdictional matters of 2012. On immunity of senior officials, there is the International UN Court uh, judgment, uh, Congo versus Belgium, uh, 2002. And all that uh, uh, has an influence on everything the European Court is saying in this regard. For instance, the judgment uh, versus uh, Italy was repeatedly quoted by the European Court, and with all respect uh, uh, to, to what was made in The Hague. When it comes to the potential changes of the court on civil cases, well, here we might uh, find a soft way of dealing with that. When, uh, we talk about uh, enforcement of the judgment that I can allow for the approach to uh, be changed gradually, but I don't think that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. But thank you very much for your comment. Uh, excellent comment. Thank you. Another question? I'll try it to be brief. Maybe it goes beyond uh, the subject matter of the presentation, since you focused on jurisdictional immunity as the procedural uh, obstacle under Article uh, 3. But there is Article 1, Protocol 1. And uh, under this article, there are more applications uh, uh, to the European Court, including the ones from the uh, um, people affected by the conflict in the East uh, due to the property being damaged or uh, uh, ruined or destroyed. Uh, do you believe that uh, national courts had sufficient jurisdiction on these cases? Because the cases on the damaged property, property um, often have references by the applicants to criminal proceedings that were opened um, based uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, the uh, terror act, uh, uh, terrorism activity. And uh, the subject uh, that uh, committed terrorist act uh, has not been established. Naturally, we assume who um, could have done that and who is believed the terrorists on that territory. So in other words, there are territories where the uh, damaged uh, property is located on the government-controlled territory um, and have always been under the Ukrainian government control, for instance, Mariupol and Shell in, um, in uh, 2015. So in other words, uh, so do not National courts have sufficient jurisdiction under Article 1, Protocol 1. Thank you for the question. Indeed, that's a completely different uh, aspect of it. If uh, under national, uh, in, in the national cases, uh, there is no state as party to it, then there is no issue of immunity. But there is a practical aspect of it. There are so many applications uh, in the European quarter that are filed against Ukraine, against Russian Federation, against both uh, simultaneously, etc. So what's going to happen to them? So we are talking about uh, exhausting uh, national remedies first. Uh, that's slightly different context. Uh, and uh, I believe that, uh, okay, let's start, to, let me start from the end, let me start with the decision. It seems to be the decision that should be delivered in Ukraine, that's a desirable, not the uh, real one, which should uh, exist in Ukraine. In Ukraine, we should have the mechanism of compensations established by law, and if uh, actually, all uh, and everybody uh, speaks uh, about that uh, for uh, the last uh, four or five years. 
um, nobody knows what, what's happening with that record. Since this, lack, this, this is missing, uh, we do have the jurisdiction of the National Court under Article 124 of the Constitution of Ukraine. This jurisdiction covers all legal relations of the state. So it's pretty much straightforward. But how national courts see that, that's the question I don't have the answer to. The only thing I know is that the case law is very diverse, and what you said about terrorist uh, acts, so that's, uh, to put it softly, doesn't add uh, any certainty or clarity to the case law that, uh, that exists in the country. We're not talking about the context of armed conflict, but the context uh, of terrorist acts, compensation to the victims of terrorist acts. There's different acts of national legislation and a different uh, legal framework here. So I believe that without systemic uh, solution, uh, it's not going to hold up. Uh, I don't know how I can put it in a more diplomatic manner. Thank you. Pavlo Pushkara and then Alexei. Thank you very much indeed. You made a very interesting comment as to nuanced approach to the practice. And uh, it seems to me that here we need to consider the aspect of uh, our, uh, the, the, the ban of uh, torture because we might uh, have the instances when the ban is uh, applied uh, uh, in the cases of excessive use of uh, uh, force in, or by law enforcement agency, uh, striking somebody against face uh, and uh, the liability for that. That was an act abstract thing, but uh, I think we should uh, add nuances to uh, what absolute ban is in the meaning of the European Court and the civil legal liability for torture. That's another issue that remains to be open, especially when it comes to the enforcement of the uh, judgments. That's a short comment to add as to the nuances. Thank you for a very good comment. Uh, let me say that absolute ban uh, under Article 3 deals with any types of uh, degrading treatment. It's not only torture. A slap uh, on the face, that's uh, a bad treatment. Uh, whether it falls uh, into the torture, but well, torture uh, is assessed based on the personality of the victim uh, and specific circumstances. Any improper behavior um, is there. So definition of torture under Article 1 of the Convention of 1984, uh, we the threshold is high, and the difference between Article and Article 16 of, of the Convention, the, f the first uh, defines torture, the other defines other types of uh, uh, improper behavior, is significant uh, with respect to mechanisms established by the Convention. But you're quite right to say that, well, you have to be really cautious and uh, very attentive because uh, nobody uh, has ever had any desire uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to, 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 to erode the uh, torture. I think that's the last thing the people need, uh, washing it uh, away. Ilyasi um, Ahmed versus Hungary is a very important judgment that impressed uh, everybody. Thank you. And I fully agree. Uh, do you want to add anything? No, no, no. I just uh, wanted to say that there is uh, an issue here, and we need to consider that too. I think we need to continue the discussions that what Mikola said um, is uh, quite uh, correct uh, in this regard. Another thing that deals uh, uh, with law that uh, what we have discussed uh, when talking about protection of the rights of uh, internally displaced persons, that's another question that remains open. And um, in the meaning of Article 1, Protocol 1, there is the issue of legislation and inability to resolve this issue through legal practice. That's something that we've discussed uh, at length with the Supreme Court and other authorities. That's another interesting um, question. Alexei. 
And use the microphone, please. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a Plotnikov, NGO, 10th of April, the city of Odessa. My question is probably theoretical, but uh, it does have practical importance for Ukraine. Here is the question. We all know that, uh, and, and you referred to the dialogue between the UN Court and European Court uh, of Human Rights, and we know that recently we had uh, unexpected a uh, claim uh, against uh, Myanmar as to uh, punishment uh, uh, for genocide as uh, the uh, expert uh, in international uh, law. Whatever the judgment in this case is, can it uh, have an impact uh, on the European Court when it comes to compensations? That they raise the issue as to the right of the state to go to the court uh, uh, as to the violation of the uh, convention when the government believes uh, that there is no violation on that. And can we see any changes as to the approaches of the universal jurisdiction? Well, let's speak about the approaches to solution of, uh, well, decisions of the court as to uh, cases on genocide and uh, torture. It would be interesting to talk about this uh, in a separate discussion. I think it's uh, good when international fora are used by the governments, uh, including this UN court and uh, uh, International Criminal Court, when they um, use these courts uh, on genocide cases. As uh, Judge Hussein reminded, here we are talking not just about uh, imperative norms, but that's erga or omnis obligations. So local stand is here, and there is uh, an opportunity to go to court on that. Uh, another thing is uh, whether that's going to have any uh, influence. I uh, don't have the answer uh, to that question, but we can um, reflect on that, but uh, in a different format and not now. Thank you. But the aspect is important. Thank you. I think we've covered all the continents um, in our presentations. Let's move over to Ukraine. Uh, let's keep Ukraine in our radar. And uh, the next presentation uh, is is going to be done by two judges of the Supreme Court. The first to speak is Dmitro Hudema, who is going to speak about the review of the National Court decisions following the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, judgments, uh, changes to procedural codes that are required. Uh, it is going to be followed by, oh, he is going to be followed by Natalia Antoniuk. participants uh, of our forum, dear organizers, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this event again. And uh, every time that's a big honor and pleasure to, uh, for me to come to Lviv and see so many familiar faces and exchange uh, opinion, experience, and find solutions uh, to the issues. I'm not going to overload you with the information uh, of complex nature. We are not going to discuss any cases, but let me attract your attention to some of the deficiencies of our procedural legislation that uh, uh, have significant impact uh, on the practice uh, of uh, applying individual measures when executing European court judgments that Ukraine uh, is uh, committed to enforce. At the beginning of my presentation, let me give you some statistics as to the cases that uh, in the course of 2018-2019, uh, until now, uh, we are considered by the Grand Chamber to duly enforce European Court judgments. Let me just uh, say that uh, uh, 92 
cases that were initiated in the Supreme Court, uh, the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court, to provide for the enforcement of European court judgments. Out of 92, only 17 are fully satisfied. Partly satisfied are 11. Uh, and uh, given these numbers, you can figure out that uh, the future of the other uh, cases is completely different. Uh, we fully dismissed uh, 47 applications. Uh, look at the uh, names of the cases. Most of these cases uh, don't have anything to do with the measures that uh, the Supreme Court can really uh, resort to to, uh, to restore the violated rights of the applicants. I'll speak about this in more detail, but uh, let me just uh, focus on different number of cases, different jurisdictions, administrative, civil, commercial, and criminal jurisdictions, where the Supreme Court, the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court, uh, dismissed the uh, applications uh, as to enforcement of European Court of Human Rights as to individual measures. Part of the applications uh, were closed, uh, 17 out of 92, to be more exact. And uh, the grounds for uh, clo closing the cases are interesting, too. And I'll speak about that in more detail. In addition to full uh, satisfaction, part of satisfaction, and uh, closing of the case in the course of two years, we returned uh, uh, some cases. Uh, um, uh, that was due to uh, exceptional circumstances and dismissed uh, to open the case. Uh, to return the application and to dismiss the uh, opening of the proceedings, traditionally the reasons were the following. Uh, the uh, applicant did not eliminate the deficiencies of the previous uh, submission or the grand job uh, already has the position on similar uh, case and that's the, the same or similar um, submission that we received or time frame uh, was um, violated, deadline was uh, missed, and uh, in another one, the grounds were not uh, significant. Uh, so as of today, in the Supreme Court, we have uh, nine applications. The case were uh, opened uh, and pending. The statistics, to some extent, uh, is a sad one because it proves that most of the uh, applications that we receive uh, uh, with respect to uh, reopen the cases based on exceptional circumstances cannot be satisfied. And uh, what's the future of this application? That, that is either a dismissal or close in the case or returning the, the, the case. So, uh, and all that proves that the mechanism that pro is provided for in procedural legislation is a is of, uh, full of significant deficiencies because it allows that a Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court receives uh, uh, submissions that uh, uh, cannot uh, achieve the result the applicant expects. Well, since he has the judgment of the European Court made in his favor, or it is the applicant that believes that the judgment of the European Court was made in his favor, though it's not true. Let's uh, just speak about some of the issues of procedural legislation that, from my perspective, are um, typical of our case law and require immediate action so that uh, uh, the individual measures uh, uh, resorted to to enforce uh, European court judgments uh, uh, have the mechanism that uh, enforce judgments and don't allow for the violations in the future. Let me um, take a step back and uh, I remind you what we started with uh, in the morning today. We uh, in Q&A, I had uh, the question asked, uh, uh, well, when uh, the uh, applicants uh, uh, believe that uh, improper um, 
in proper detention conditions is that the ground to reopen the case. But uh, it's not uh, uh, the only thing I wanted to focus on. The first thing I would like to address is that procedural legislation provides a very short term for consideration of a certain application. For example, civil procedural code or administrative code uh, for such a consideration uh, provide a term of 30 days. And it is logical that, for example, uh, in the archive of the Supreme Court, court there is no uh, a template of a, a case. And one of the problems is that the task, uh, the time to get the uh, case, for example, from the first instance court and the time for translating the corresponding judgment of the European court will already exceed the established period of 30 days. So probably we should not restrict ourselves to the period of 30 days and, for example, deceive ourselves that within that period of time the judgment can be taken, uh, can be delivered and the cases will be reviewed. Moreover, there are cases when the applicant should be present uh, personally. I did not mention here the criminal code. The terms are slightly different there, but we have here a colleague uh, who is a member of the Grand Chamber uh, and probably she is also of the opinion that the terms mentioned in the criminal code of Ukraine are not sufficient to take a decision and to uh, implement it into life. Why I think that we should prolong the term for uh, reviewing the judgments of the national courts up to two or three months. For example, when we need the authentic translation of the um, European Court judgment, the problem is uh, not in the fact that the Ministry of Justice needs some time to produce this authentic translation. Uh, another problem is that uh, request for this authentic translation, according to the logic of the procedural code, uh, which uh, are in effect today, uh, provides uh, that this request, this uh, translation should be done at the request of the applicant. And if the applicant does not uh, send this request, for example, he or she knows perfectly well the English language or any other language and does not require this translation. And uh, for example, uh, when we talk about our law um, in the European court, if there is no official translation, the court uh, should be guided by the original document. This is a problem because not all uh, the Ukrainian judges know the English language to such an extent that to understand the language, to apply and uh, to enforce. If we talk about a similar understanding of the European court uh, judgments, uh, definitely uh, is required. Moreover, if we understand that this procedure is necessary, at least nowadays, then probably we should not uh, relate the uh, translation to the request of the applicant. If there is no such request on the part of the applicant, it means uh, uh, we have somehow to send a petition, etc or we have to request it independently. But the procedure uh, is not provided for in the code. I mean, neither procedural code provides for this activity. And uh, I think that all procedural action um, definitely should promote uh, knowledge of the foreign languages uh, by the judges. Uh, but let's say, we should have similar conditions for everybody, uh, for the judges to be able to take a well-grounded judgment after considering a certain uh, lawsuit. So the proposal is to uh, provide for authentic translation in all the cases, but and not uh, the way we have it now, when it should be requested by the applicant. The second problem 
uh, that the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court is faced with for many times is related to the idea uh, of uh, court sessions. Uh, when we uh, are supposed to have these sessions and uh, due to some circumstances. For example, today we uh, had already an example that uh, there were several parties in the case, several participants in the case, and for example, uh, when you have to uh, review the case and there are about 80 people, you have to summon all of them. Uh, there may be other situations, but the necessity of such court sessions uh, may cause that the term of consideration will be violated, certain court sessions will be uh, postponed and delayed, but the result of the review probably will be understandable both for the applicant and for the court who uh, that already knows what kind of uh, judgment will be adopted. But until all the uh, participants of a case are summoned, the court cannot convene a session. And logically, the proposal is to include international legislation the opportunity to consider uh, cases on overturn of judicial decision without notifying all the parties, all the participants. And the final aspect, probably I will discuss it in more details because uh, it will be about one more problem we faced with uh, since 2018, and this was the uh, review of the recourse uh, or petitions or applications which are obvious to all the members and which will not uh, have any results for the applicant. This, uh, we have the requirement to start court proceedings uh, in all the cases and as a result, the applicant might be guided by some false hopes that they might get some results. They are happy when the proceedings is opened according to their application. Uh, later, they try to promote this information in social networks, in the press, that the Grand Chamber actually opened the proceedings on the basis of the application, and uh, their false hopes for the consideration are formed not only uh, with the applicant himself herself, but in uh, many other people who might uh, have a similar situation to that of the applicant. Another problem is the, the, uh, the fact that the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court is really overloaded with the application of the result of the consideration of which and the final outcome is uh, already obvious and uh, uh, therefore my proposal is that we should uh, amend the procedural legislation of Ukraine and we include such an institute as a refusal or dismissal of applications uh, and uh, under certain circumstances, this institute may be used. So what kind of circumstances are we talking about here? Uh, Ms. Antoniuk has already described one of such situations when we have uh, lots of applications on the ground that uh, there is the decision of the European Court that the detention conditions were improper, uh, but the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court in one of its resolutions and later in many others clearly indicated that the uh, uh, remedy of individual character uh, cannot be used uh, to review the decisions of the national courts when, uh, for example, violations uh, when violations uh, by Ukraine uh, were found and they were not related to the case of the applicant. For example, uh, uh, for example, a person was not the applicant to the European Court on Human uh, Rights, but uh, the person considers that the, her situation is similar and therefore uh, um, that person supply, uh, applies for the review. Uh, also, uh, 
there are situations when, for example, some applicants are the authors of a number of or are initiators of a number of court proceedings at the national level, and very often uh, certain court proceedings uh, really is important to the uh, applicant. And for example, the applicant uh, refers to the uh, term uh, of uh, case consideration, and there is, uh, for example, the similar case which was considered by the European Court on Human Rights, but it was, for example, case of Mr. Uh, y, and therefore the results of this case uh, are uh, cited as the ground uh, to initiate the court proceedings for Mr. X. And logically, this may not always be the case. And also, there are situations when uh, the uh, court judgments of the European Court of Human Rights can be enforced uh, when the state takes a number of measures of general characters. Today, we have already heard the name Burmach versus Ukraine, and uh, here the European Court really faced. Uh, the Supreme Court of Ukraine had a number of problems related to that case because lots of applicants whose applications were excluded from the register thought that the European Court of Human Rights uh, took a decision in their favor and the Supreme Court probably would reconsider uh, their cases um, in their favor. And uh, uh, also it was about uh, those cases when the national judgments were in favor of a person but uh, the decision was not enforced. And there were lots of cases when uh, people considered that Burmach uh, judgment, European court judgment, would actually uh, make their situation better. And uh, uh, there is one more case when the European court judgments are about exceptional duration of proceedings at the national level or uh, are related to the enforcement of a certain judgment uh, at the national level. There are a number of, uh, lots of applications about this issue in the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court, and due to um, some imperfection of the national legislation, we face a number of problematic issues. Uh, we have to initiate the court proceedings, and uh, we actually have to uh, finish the case um, not in a way uh, that is actually expected by the applicant. In my opinion, the Institute, uh, when we dismiss the uh, review uh, of the case, can also be applied uh, if the application on review of the court judgment is uh, submitted after the term established by the law and uh, there is no, for example, grounds to renew the term. There are cases when uh, five years passed or seven years passed, the person somehow remembers that there were some decisions of the European Court on Human Rights and the, pers the person is trying to bring back these decisions of the European Court on Human Rights in order to review his or her judgment. And again, uh, lack of the provision to dismiss such an application creates the situation when the applicant uh, is, so to say, uh, using the kindness of our grand chamber in inverted commas and uh, initiates the proceedings and is advertising that the proceedings are opened and probably this decision will be to my uh, in my favor. So I think that uh, these drawbacks should be somehow addressed and should be corrected. Uh, thank you for your attention. This is everything from me. And if you have any questions, I'll be uh, ready to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hudema. Let's hope that your proposals will be uh, taken into account by the Parliament. Dear colleagues, uh, do we have any questions or comments? Yes, we have uh, here at least one question, and the Minister of Justice uh, uh, also was mentioned. Thank you. Thank you for your proposals. My name is Andrei Mamaleho.
you have raised a very important issue because I, as a lawyer, participated uh, in a number of cases of the European Court on Human Rights. One of such cases was uh, Mikola Karpiuk versus Ukraine. And uh, the case was when three participants of the protest to Ukraine without Kuchma uh, were recognized as the ones whose rights were violated according to the European Convention. The judgment was taken in 2017 when uh, Mikola Karpiuk was actually imprisoned in the territory of the Russian Federation. And uh, logically, he was not able to submit the application within an established period of time. Another participant of a similar case really referred to, uh, applied to the Supreme Court, and his lawsuit was dismissed uh, on the grounds that, again, the uh, term was exceeded. So the term has expired. I analyzed the situation, and I also submitted a number of proposals that either we have to prolonged, prolong the term uh, because uh, three months, which is the current period, is definitely too short. Uh, it's Sometimes it's not enough even to uh, get and to properly read the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. But actually, I have a totally different position. If we take the law on enforcement or execution of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, then there is an article that states that the state is obliged, after the compensation is paid, uh, to use the uh, uh, individual remedies uh, uh, related to the restoration of the previous condition. And uh, I was thinking. Uh, why the uh, prosecutor's office, for example, sh should uh, submit such an application in order to restore the rights of the citizen. Probably this should be the case. If the state is obliged to do it, then probably the citizen uh, should have the right to not to uh, initiate such uh, proceedings in case he will get the information uh, from the state. So this is my proposal, actually, to introduce amendments to the situation, to the legislation. For example, when the European Court of Human Rights uh, takes a judgment on violation of Article 6 of the Convention, the state prosecutor should submit such an application to the Supreme Court. Talking about the dismissals you have mentioned, uh, actually I tried to register all the cases and proceedings that are uh, opened in the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court with relation to the judgments of the European Court on Human Rights. And honestly, I do not remember the surnames you have mentioned. Talking about the term, uh, according to our legislation, the period, the term, is not uh, the ground to dismiss the uh, proceedings. And, uh, for example, if the application has been dismissed, probably there were, there were no grounds to restore the period. And you remember that it is possible. And uh, really, uh, we had such cases when people, for example, were hospitalized, uh, were on treatment, and therefore they explained that they missed the term for uh, submitting the application. So uh, these are exceptional circumstances, and these are serious reasons, and court took them into account. Therefore, currently, I cannot uh, actually address your question because I do not remember such cases in the Grand Chamber. Really, your idea is interesting when the state itself initiates review of the case at the national level. Probably this might be an interesting situation, but when we talk about criminal proceedings, uh, the representatives of the prosecutor's office 
uh, sometimes uh, do not object to what is asked by the applicant because they understand that the judgment of the European Court on Human Rights should be executed. This is something we face in practice now. Somehow the microphone of the speaker is off. So the mic is on already. I'm talking about your proposal. I probably will be very cautious here. If the state uh, itself initiates the proceedings, and for example, if there is the judgment of the European Court about Article 6, you know that the term are quite significant. Just imagine, in some eight or ten years, the European Court established that there was a certain procedural violation, and here the state automatically opens the proceedings. What does it mean for a person? Probably a person has already uh, spent the imprisonment, or a person was uh, released on parole, or a person, for example, is in a pen penitentiary uh, facility, and a person will be brought back to the detention facility, and everything starts from the beginning. So, um, if it was some we have to understand whether this procedural violation uh, was uh, the one that influenced the proceedings. And not all the convicts are ready to go through the whole procedure, once again, to uh, stay in the detention facility, to wait for the witness being summoned, etc. And it really will be interesting to see the statistics, how many people who are um, actually sub referred to the European courts and uh, whose cases were found as ones where there was violation of Article Six. So, how many of these people later uh, initiated the uh, new proceedings under the national law? So, I think here we should be very cautious. At least a person should have the right uh, to uh, object to a review of his uh, of her judgment. I, uh, well, Mr. Mamaleha actually described the situation when a person was uh, imprisoned abroad and actually didn't have any access to the national legislation. So probably for this particular situation, this is very specific situation, uh, really might be the case when the state itself initiates the proceedings and we should include the opportunity for the applicant or uh, to object to such initiation. So if a person uh, files, for example, the application to the uh, European Court on Human Rights and even, for example, imprisoned in Ukrainian penitentiary facil facilities, uh, I actually have not come, uh, have not met such convicts who, for example, would not like their case to be reviewed. Let me support Hanna. I fully agree with her. Uh, violation of Article 6 uh, is uh, stated in the instances when, in the course of the national uh, uh, hearing, in the course of the first instance and concession instance, the lens of proceedings of uh, hearing the case and the merits uh, was violated. So apparently, uh, Reinstating the restitution uh, ad integrum uh, cannot be done by extending the proceedings. So, in this case, it's compensation, satisfactory satisfaction, and the sexual article 6 of the convention that says that we shouldn't. Uh, uh, have any uh, national revision. It should be the group of cases, that's what Metro was uh, talking about, uh, where the Supreme Court should refuse uh, opening the proceedings or uh, uh, refuse accepting the applications. I don't want to dis to continue this discussion because it may never end, uh, though I fully support uh, Hannah. 
Here is the question, and the question to you as a representative of Civil Cassation Court in the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court. I know the case law of uh, Poland on enforcement of European Court judgment, and here is specificity here versus Ukraine. Similar to Ukraine, revision of the cases is granted on criminal cases. Theoretically, there is a chance to to revise the decisions on administrative cases, though they never happened in practice. But Poland uh, uh, refused the possibility to review the decisions in civil and commercial cases, uh, believing that there is a risk of uh, violating the rights of uh, the other party uh, to civil uh, process. You know that uh, this right uh, exists in Ukraine on civil and criminal matters. Sorry, uh, civil and commercial cases. When the opposite uh, party in the civil or commercial case uh, is the state, then there is no problem. But what if it is private uh, individual? Then the question the question is, does the Grand Chamber, when uh, revising uh, judgments on civil cases, into consideration that there is a third party to the process, and for the latter, revoking decision under this procedure may result uh, in violation of its right to stable court uh, decision? Thank you. That's a very interesting issue. And clearly, it uh, is linked uh, to the proper fulfillment of positive obligations of the state, including the uh, governing of the relations between private uh, um, entities. Uh, and if uh, that's the conflict between private entities that resulted in the situation when one of the parties uh, believing that the conventional rights were violated went to the European Court. In the uh, practice of the Grand Chamber, we had cases like that, but they were about protecting the, right, the best interests of the child. It was European Court judgments that uh, we uh, made under Article 8 of the Convention. And in that situation, the Grand Chamber having all materials of the case and having the European Court judgment uh, and a regional text of the uh, judgment as well as authentic translation was careful when analyzing what does the does it mean when we say in the best interest of the child, what should be done? Uh, and I can't remember the situation when our decision can um, be risky to the interest of the child. On the contrary, Grand Chamber, through its decisions when enforcing European court judgment, tried to protect the interests of the child. But I do, inter uh, do understand the situation that may appear in practice, uh, for instance, stability uh, of uh, civil uh, uh, interest and uh, protection of property. Well, it might happen, but uh, while well, I can't uh, sort of draft uh, the judgment that uh, is pending yet, uh, well, we can just reflect on this and uh, and uh, decide what would be the best to do. The approach that you described, uh, um, based on Polish experience, well, I impossibility of revising administrative court decisions. Well, in Ukraine, this could result uh, in the right, well, they didn't have it in practice. Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court revised a lot of uh, administrative court decisions when enforcing European court judgments under two respective individual measures to provide for the right of appeal uh, that uh, was not granted uh, to many, or guaranteed rather, to many applicants uh, to comply with the process and and to provide for the quality of arms, the measures undertaken were necessary. That's why we made respective uh, judgments on that. Nazar Kulchitsky. And then we'll have to move on. Pavlo Bushkar wanted to say something. In the Department of the Execution of Judgments of the European Court, we are uh, 
preparing the practice of the Committee of Ministers of Europe as to reopening the uh, uh, proceedings based on the European Court uh, judgments. We are going to complete that by the end of the year, and uh, we'll be happy to disseminate this with you. We cover various issues, the rights of third parties, reopening the proceedings as uh, uh, to with respect to several accomplices uh, to the offense. Uh, maybe you have a short uh, answer to this question that I'm going to raise. When uh, I am uh, here, the word authentic translation of the judgments, uh, me and Ivan, we all uh, uh, well, uh, start being uh, on the alert. Well, we um, we have the assessment of the law of 2017, and we want to implement uh, this. Uh, um, what I mean is the 20 recommendations that uh, deal with uh, various aspects, including translations. By law, the government can prepare three types of translations. The first, that's uh, the operative uh, part of the judgment. The second translation, that's short version of the judgment. And third is full authentic translation of the judgment. Official authentic translation certified by the Minister of Justice. And uh, under the law, uh, it is the uh, uh, Department uh, of uh, um, Court Decisions that is uh, to take care of enforcing decisions that is to take care of the translation and dis disseminate these translations among the judges. Um, well, authenticity of translation is a very important issue. So, um, well, the requirement to disseminate uh, the judgments and compliance with the European court case law, I, I think we need to so, sort of, you know, to m match all that. Authentic translation was used by me deliberately. It's not because I need it. Uh, well, to understand the judgments better. Well, authentic translation is used by all the code, it's a civil, procedural, administrative code. Uh, the criminal code is the one that only one that doesn't use authentic translation terminology. Since it is used in the legislation, I decided to use it to in my presentation and I actually explained what, what, what are the problems um, related to authentic translation. Three codes out of four um, refer to the um, request of the applicant to get the original with the translation, and if it is the translation that the applicant is uh, seeking, then it is authentic translation. I do understand the uh, uh, workload that Ministry of Justice has uh, given this number of requests. Even Burimich case uh, require uh, making 50 copies of authentic translations for the Grand Chamber. Well, uh, well, that's a lot of paper to start with. Well, and that's also costly. We buy, we buy paper. Well, I do apologize, but, uh, you know, Paolo wanted to have brief answer. So the brief answer is authentic translation issue is caused by the effect of legislation. And uh, what Paolo was talking about uh, are the things that are clear to me, and we needed to uh, to consider all that, but the, nation, uh, the national judges should learn uh, languages of the European Court of Human Rights and learn them well, be able to speak them. Well, we had to translate the Burmich case judgment, though it exceeded our powers as uh, uh, per law. New codes expanded our powers. We had to come up with a new procedure uh, meant for the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court. We fortunately made it up for the Grand Chamber, but authentic translation is part of uh, enforcement. Uh, of the judgments, and that's very important. So that's part of the enforcement procedure. That's why under the law, 
we translate the judgments that are A, against Ukraine and B, the judgments that established violation. Article 17 of the law, nevertheless, require the judges uh, to um, apply all judgments of the European Court, and we can't have an authentic translation of all of them because the government doesn't uh, uh, do that. So where uh, can we get the authentic translation of the judgment against Ireland made in 1975? I think uh, we need a, a separate session on translation. Let me focus uh, our session on uh, the subject matter. Nazar, a uh, very brief question. Nazar Kulichetsky. Here is my question. When we talk about uh, review of the decisions following the European Court judgments, we have uh, specific uh, applicants in mind. Uh, what if it is a group of inmates or several parties to the process? That's one thing, but here is another element to it. Reviewing the national court decisions based on the European court judgments could be a very good uh, measure of, uh, could be very good uh, uh, general measure, because if it was a violation based on the case law, it is the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court that should assess this problem, uh, draw conclusions and remedy it, uh, versus the situation when the the government agent uh, write, uh, writes letters to the National Court of Judges, uh, and, uh, you know, the, so it's not uh, a very effective uh, way of dealing with that. Maybe I didn't get you quite uh, right. Uh, maybe I got it uh, properly, but, well, apparently the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court is not the authority that uh, when uh, they're dealing with the uh, uh, reopening of the cases should emit, uh, at the same time resort to uh, the application of individual measures. Um, it looks that uh, then that we need to review all the cases. Uh, well, no, 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 you didn't get me right. What I'm saying is that uh, Supreme Court should draw clear cut legal conclusions based on these cases. So that I'm not talking about revision at all. I'm talking about the preventive side. So that the Supreme Court, if uh, reopening is based on the deficiencies of legal case, Supreme Court should assess the situation and provide clarifications. Opinion of the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, are actually reflected in the decisions of the Grand Chamber, and they are mandatory to be uh, taken into consideration by courts of all levels. Uh, do we need to prepare a separate document, uh, like a letter to uh, send it to the courts or any other documents? I don't believe so. It seems to me that uh, the opinion is clearly expressed in uh, the uh, resolutions on the enforcement of the European Court judgments. You know what? Uh, every minute I feel that I fail as a moderator because I will never be able to finish on time. Natalia, over to you. It's an honor for me to speak here at uh, this university because that's my alma mater. I uh, was teaching for more than 10 years. That was the course of criminal law. And I'm happy to see familiar faces in this room. And uh, for, I'll pick up from Metro. And as a follow-up, I would like to focus on the problems that we have when uh, uh, in the European Court uh, judgments and exceptional circumstances. So the margin of appreciations uh, uh, here. 
Let me just uh, say here that uh, the um, court proceedings in the criminal cases is so-called traditional. Uh, so that's the court of the first instance, first, then court of appeal and cassation uh, instances. So that tr these are traditional cases. And there are so there is so-called extraordinary revision that is uh, resorted to in exceptional circumstances, based on exceptional circumstances, and revision based on the new identified uh, uh, circumstances. The latter two are non-traditional, and uh, they are uh, characteristic not of all the criminal proceedings. So the procedure of revision is clearly governed by, art, uh, by criminal uh, code, Article 459, uh, paragraph uh, 2, part 3, uh, where it is clearly stated that if there is a, 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 a conclusion of the international uh, court that found that Ukraine violated, for instance, the European Convention, then the national court uh, should uh, review this uh, decision and uh, uh, rule uh, whether the violations found by the international court um, influence the uh, criminal case and the convicted. Let me just uh, speak about several problems here. The first one uh, when is when European court uh, found violation of the uh, provisions of the Convention that require application of the general measures. A typical case here is the one that uh, was on the pages of all newspapers and in, in, in the center of all media outlets, that's Peter Hofer versus Ukraine. Everybody knows this uh, judgment, so lifers are entitled uh, to have hope and uh, uh, national criminal code uh, doesn't provide uh, sufficient opportunities to exercise this right. In addition to Peter Hoff, uh, there are uh, many people that are sentenced for life. And as soon as European court delivered this judgment, Grand Chamber started receiving thousands of complaints from lifers. They all believe that uh, Grand Chamber should revise their specific cases and uh, apply European court judgment as the source of law in their specific cases. Along with that, uh, Grand Chamber couldn't uh, review these uh, uh, judgments for several reasons. Uh, the ground ex of exceptional circumstance, circumstance is the judgment of European Court with respect to specific applicant. If it were not Mr. Pitohov, who was an applicant in this case, then apparently we can't uh, say that uh, revision can happen uh, under except, uh, based on exceptional circumstances. The uh, Supreme Court judges and academia repeatedly said that uh, respective amendments to the criminal code are needed to uh, enforce the European Court judgment. And we were heard, and uh, at the moment, uh, the respective amendments have been submitted to the parliament for approval. Second uh, issue I wanted to focus on is the is as follows. In some instances, applicant that uh, committed several offenses uh, goes to a European court. At the same time, European court found a violation of the convention on some offenses committed by the applicant, but not to all uh, offenses committed by them. Uh, so the question here is, uh, is there a reason to revoke the uh, uh, con um, co con conviction of uh, the applicant with respect to all the offenses? And uh, can the Grand Chamber right to uh, abrogate the decisions of the national courts only in the part where the European court uh, found a violation of the convention? And the other 
uh, parts should remain unchanged. For instance, Sitnevsky, Chilikovsky versus Ukraine, Zakshevsky versus Ukraine. Here we um, talk about group of people uh, convicted for um, banditism. They committed eight counts of uh, a criminal activity. I'm not going to read of them. For instance, uh, homicide with aggravating circumstances, deliberate uh, uh, homicide, then uh, a deliberate uh, homicide of five people, and uh, assault, uh, banditism. So that's a huge number of counts of uh, unlawful criminal activity that are not linked with each other. The only link here is they were committed by the same individuals. That's it. So European court uh, and uh, let me pay due here because uh, this case is extremely complex and European court judgment is so detailed and thorough and so explicit and clear that it allowed for us to clearly establish where at what counts the uh, on what counts the convention was violated for instance with respect to Chekovsky, the violation of the convention was established on count four and seven each of you probably has already come to a certain conclusion and answered the question whether we should really uh, revoke counts uh, uh, one, two, etc., or we should only uh, just revoke the uh, judgments on counts four and seven, while all the rest should be left unchanged, because in this part there were no violations of the convention. Another case which is similar, Shabelnik versus Ukraine, and Shabelnik number two versus Ukraine. The uh, person was uh, found guilty for two counts. The first count, kidnapping, uh, homicide of the child, and uh, extortion of money f from parents for the child. Uh, count number two, uh, intentional murder of the elderly person, and also assault on this person. Uh, the European Court in the uh, reasoning part clearly stated that there is violation of paragraph 1 and 3 of Article 6 uh, of the Convention and clearly stated that uh, conviction for the homicide of this elderly person is based on uh, the testimonies uh, w uh, that were obtained with violation of the convicted rights uh, for s keeping silent. And this actually, uh, here we see that um, one of the uh, counts was not analyzed in the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, in such cases I have just illustrated the uh, decisions should be revoked only in those parts where there were violations of the conventions. In the examples I have provided, uh, the uh, restitution in, in, in integrum principle was applied, and uh, the uh, cases in some counts were sent back to the court, first instance court. And those uh, and the decisions were not revoked in those parts where there were no violations of our article. These counts were not evaluated by the European Court, and therefore they didn't include, didn't have any violations of the Convention. And the Grand Chamber clearly stated that in the second case, uh, we uh, they. Uh, principle of res uh, judicata is applied. So th we should not revoke the decision uh, in the part which is not contested by the applicant itself. So logically, I actually wanted you to see the consequences, the potential variants uh, after the review of the case by the Grand Chamber. So if the European Court established violation of the norms of the Convention with respect to one or several counts, the National Court 
may uh, consider that it's necessary to fully review the case in this part. If the European Court did not establish such violations, there are no grounds to revoke judicial uh, court decisions in this part. And please have a look at this slide because we talk about legal consequences and enforcement of the judgments taken by the Grand Chamber. If the uh, court sentence has been uh, overturned, the first instance court has to evaluate all the evidence, has to apply the uh, uh, period of limitation, should once again examine the uh, evidence uh, in just uh, investigate the case, ask the witnesses, etc., and to understand what does it mean, uh, for example, after the uh, judgment of the first instance court, the evidence, material evidence, actually are destroyed. And uh, the uh, uh, judgment is not uh, revoked or overturned if the European court did not establish violation of the norms. Uh, it means we should not uh, re-evaluate the evidence. We should not establish uh, the uh, period uh, of limitation because the uh, first instance court judgment is not uh, cancelled. We should not uh, examine the witnesses, the victims, the convict once again, I mean, the interrogate them. Uh, and. It means uh, we should not reconsider the case once again. And I also would like to address one more group of cases. This is the cases when we use the so-called theory uh, about fruits of a poisonous tree. Um, but actually, as you probably are overloaded with the information, I will postpone this part of my presentation probably for some next forum or platform. Uh, this is everything from me. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Antoniuk, for your report and for filling the audience, so to say. Uh, Natalia, what is your opinion? Uh, don't we violate the principle of legal determination? For example, when you were talking about the case of Shabelnik versus Ukraine, when, for example, in some 15 years, when we know that the person was uh, actually punished uh, and uh, the term uh, will uh, terminate it. Um, so when we, uh, but the term actually will expire. The European Court on Human Rights uh, actually considered uh, the part on kidnapping. Uh, and uh, here there were no violations found, and the principle of first judicata was applied. So if this count was not considered by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and uh, for example, if we're talking about bringing the parents of the child uh, once again to the courtroom, making them uh, experience uh, all those events, once again, probably should uh, not be the case. And uh, there were no grounds to revoke that count, and there were no issues related to the um, period of limitation. Thank you. Dear colleagues, are there uh, any other questions? Thank you. We also planned the report of Mrs. Olga Dmitrenko, who is the lawyer of the European Court of Human Rights. But here we have a proposal if Mr. Uh, Pavlo uh, does not, uh, is, is not against it, probably we shift it for tomorrow, for the morning, 9.30, 10 o'clock. No, no, unfortunately, 10 o'clock. So, 
So we shift the last report from today for tomorrow, 10 o'clock. So this is the end of our first day. Thank you very much for your attention, and we meet tomorrow.